This hearing will come to order. Appreciate uh, everyone's attendance and welcome everybody here in this joint committee, uh, joint subcommittee hearing, uh, the Subcommittee on Government Organization, Efficiency and Financial Management, along with the Subcommittee on Healthcare, District of Columbia, Census, and the National Archives. Today's hearing will examine the serious problem of fraud, waste, and abuse in Medicaid. In fiscal year 2011, the Medicaid program issued $21.9 billion in improper payments higher than any program in government except Medicare. It is unknown how much of these improper payments are fraudulent or how much fraud goes undetected. The Integrity Program is responsible for identifying improper payments, educating providers about fraud, and providing assistance to States in order to combat fraud and abuse. The Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010 expanded funding for Medicaid program integrity. However, it also expands the size of the Medicaid program and will increase Medicaid spending by over $600 billion between 2014 and 2021. Given this dramatic expansion, fraud detection and prevention will be all the more important. Better quality Excuse me, better data quality is essential in reducing waste, fraud, and abuse. In 2006, CMS initiated two new data systems in an attempt to improve quality and access. GAO issued a report finding that both of the new systems were inadequate and underutilized. GAO also could not find any evidence of financial benefits in implementing the new systems, despite the fact that CMS has been using them for over five years. There are also problems with State reported data. Many States are not reporting all required data, and there are often uh, lag times for up to one year between when States report data and when CMS gets it and verifies it. This makes it extremely difficult and often impossible to prevent data fraud before payments are issued. And as I know we will hear in the testimony here today from one of our witnesses, uh, some of the information is as old as 12 years, which is just uh, un unthinkable as far as the usefulness of it. As a result of poor data systems, CMS relies on contractors to identify fraud through audit work. CMS spent $42 million on Medicaid integrity contractors in 2010. However, GAO has noted pervasive deficiencies in CMS's oversight of its contractors and has issued numerous recommendations to CMS. Most of these recommendations have not been implemented. The Office of Inspector General has been on the front lines of investigating fraud through its work with the State Medicaid Fraud Control Units, MFCUs. In 2010, these units conducted 9,710 fraud investigations and recovered $1.8 billion. This work is essential and will become even more crucial as Medicaid expands. But States have limited resources to combat the rising problem of Medicaid fraud. And there is also a question of the uh, incentive of States to do so because of much of the money is coming back to the Federal Government, not to their own Treasury. Health care fraud is sometimes called a faceless or victimless crime, and we often talk about it in terms of money lost. As a result, it can be easy to overlook what a devastating impact it can have on victims, beneficiaries who do not get the care that they need and deserve. Today we are joined by one such individual, Mr. Richard West, a Vietnam War veteran and a victim of Medicaid fraud. He and his lawyer, uh, along with his son, will testify here today about their personal experiences and their efforts to uncover fraud within a Medicaid program. And their case is going to show that this isn't just about money. This is about ensuring that we do right by every American citizen who is in need of medical assistance and is a part of the Medicaid program. As uh, Mr. West will share, it wasn't just the millions of dollars that was being stolen from American taxpayers. It was because of that fraud that he was being denied care through the Medicaid program. It's not just about money. It's about people. We will also hear testimony from CMS, OIG, and GAO on systemic problems within Medicaid and what must be done to provide effective oversight and reduce fraud, waste, and abuse in the Medicaid program. I am now honored to recognize uh, the ranking member of uh, our subcommittee, uh, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Towns, for an opening statement. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me thank the ranking member, Davis, as well, uh, 
for convening today's hearing on fraud in the Medicaid system. Weeding out fraud is a bipartisan goal that all stewards of taxpayers' dollars should share. So I truly appreciate this opportunity to explore this subject fully. I thank the witnesses on both panels for joining us today to discuss their views. I especially would like to thank Mr. West for sharing his story and for his service to this country, the Vietnam War. Mr. West, I salute you. There is no question that Medicaid is an essential program. It provides a vital safety net for many children, seniors, and the disabled who truly need it. It is unfortunate, however, that it has become a target for bad actors seeking to game the system. There is some positive news to note, even in this era of budget cuts. CMS and its efforts to undercover fraud are actually making money for the government and for tax players. For every $1 invested in fraud prevention and detection, over $16 is actually recovered. Much of this recovery came from cases like the very successful case brought by Mr. West. We need to be certain that we are encouraging whistleblowers who become aware of these cases in the Medicaid program to bring them forward. This administration has done an admirable job of stepping up fraud detection in the Medicare and Medicaid programs. However, I understand that there have been a number of recommendations made by GAO that intends to address this issue but have not yet been adopted. I look forward to exploring the limitations that CMS and HHS has so that we can work together to further prevent undercover and recover payments in the Medicaid system. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, of course, and, uh, for this hearing, and I look forward to working with you, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Towns. Uh, now honored to yield to the Chairman of the Subcommittee on Health Care, District of Columbia, Census, and the National Ar Archives, the distinguished gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Chairman Gowdy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today the committee will hear from Richard West, a man with firsthand knowledge of how easily government programs are defrauded and how the government all too often just doesn't seem to care. Mr. West acted responsibly and alerted the State of New Jersey, Medicaid, and his social worker to the fraudulent behavior of his health care provider. But none of the government agencies did anything. This is wholly unacceptable. And this is why people have lost trust in the institutions of government. And this is why our fellow citizens have so little trust that we are spending their money as carefully as we would spend our own. Mr. West kept track of the nursing care received and was able to compare his records to the provider's records. He found discrepancies, and because Medicaid capped the monthly services provided to Mr. West, he was not receiving the care he was entitled to. In other words, due to the fraudulent activities of the company providing Mr. West care, he reached the cap, and Medicaid told him his services were suspended. So not only was the provider ripping off taxpayers, but the provider was also not providing the obligated services to Mr. West. It is impossible to believe that Mr. West's story is isolated. Medicaid is designated a high-risk program and is therefore highly susceptible to waste, fraud, and abuse. Many experts believe the loss rates for Medicare and Medicaid due to fraud equals about 20 percent of the total program funding. So perhaps as much as one-fifth of the money spent is wasted and ignoring legitimate calls for investigations into fraud when witnessed firsthand has a chilling effect on other like-minded people who might be willing to alert authorities to abuse. Most of the fraud occurs when providers bill for services never delivered to Medicaid patients. According to Malcolm Sparrow, a Harvard University expert on health care fraud, the rule for criminals is simple. If you want to steal from Medicare or Medicaid or any other health care insurance program, learn to bill your lies correctly. Then, for the most part, your claims will be paid in full and on time without a hiccup, by a computer, with no human involvement at all. One reason for high rates of abuse might be that states do not appear to have an adequate incentive to root out waste and fraud. This is in large part due to the fact that a large part of what is recovered must be sent back to Washington. Another reason may be the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services 
doesn't typically analyze claims data for over a year after the, the date the claim was filed. This lag time indicates CMS needs to update the tracking system used to root waste, fraud, and abuse of the Medicaid system out. Although every tax dollar inappropriately spent is a concern, the magnitude of waste, fraud, and abuse in Medicaid elevates this problem. Our country now spends $430 billion on Medicaid a year, and CMS projects the total spending on Medicaid will double by the end of this decade. States are struggling to deal with Medicaid's growth, and Medicaid is crowding out state priorities like education, transportation, and public safety. I look forward to today's hearing and hearing from our witnesses and hopefully fleshing out ideas for limiting the amount of tax dollars that are being wasted through, Medicaid, through the Medicaid program. When folks like Mr. West are being hurt and neglected due to fraud, it is time to find solutions. And our fellow citizens, the ones who trust us enough to let us be their voice in this town, are increasingly losing confidence that we are not serious about tackling waste, fraud, and abuse. We must reclaim their confidence. We do that one episode at a time, and we might as well start with Mr. West. With that, I would yield back to the Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Uh, now pleased and honored to yield to the ranking member of the Subcommittee, Subcommittee on Health Care, District of Columbia, Census, and National Archives, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Platts, Chairman Gowdy, Ranking Member Towns. I thank all of you for holding today's hearing. Reducing waste, fraud, and abuse in health care is a rare and desirable policy shared by Republicans and Democrats alike. It is disturbing that some entrusted with caring for our most vulnerable populations would seek to defraud the government by falsely billing for services. It is the height of corporate greed. In this era of budget shortfalls and cuts, we can no longer stumble upon these bad actors. We must be vigilant in locating and weeding out fraud. The proper resources must be dedicated to root out waste and abuse. Our taxpayer dollars are too precious. The more funds expended on phantom services delay or extinguish the authentic, necessary health care programs and services that people depend upon daily. As Medicaid is determined to be a high-risk program, I want to further encourage CMS to fully utilize and implement all of the tools available in this fight, including the integrated data repository and the one program integrity. These technological programs are invaluable in consolidating the data necessary in fraud detection. The Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act further provides tools to fight Medicaid fraud. The licensure and background checks on providers and suppliers are a productive first step for program integrity. In the enforcement arena, the new silver penalties created for falsifying information is evidence that the Federal Government takes fraud seriously. To that end, the Affordable Care Act adds $10 million annually for fiscal years 2011 through 2020. Simply put, fighting health care fraud is good fiscal policy. And I might add that I am totally opposed to fraudulent practices in medicine, especially involving the most vulnerable, the most unsuspecting, and in many instances the most gullible members of our society. I have seen firsthand low-income communities filled with Medicaid meals, where people are lined up to be taken advantage of. These are practices we should not, cannot, and must not tolerate. Therefore, I applaud the tireless efforts of Mr. Richard West. He serves as an example to others. He saw a wrong and tried to right it. And so we all thank you, Mr. West. I look forward to your testimony and the testimony of all the witnesses. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and yield back. Thank the gentleman. Uh, we have also been joined 
by the distinguished ranking member of the full Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummins, and I recognize him for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I would uh, also like to thank Mr. West for taking the time to come to Capitol Hill today to share his experience so we might apply the lessons learned from his case to future policy and law enforcement decisions. Last year, Medicaid provided critical health care services to an estimated 56 million Americans in need, the vast majority of whom are seniors, individuals with disabilities, and children. Since so many Americans rely on this program, it is imperative that we root out fraud, because every dollar squandered is a dollar that does not go to critical health care services for these vulnerable Americans. Today's hearing focuses on a case that was brought to light by Richard West, a Medicaid beneficiary who asserted his rights under the False Claims Act to prosecute fraud against the Medicaid system by Maxim Health Care Service. Mr. West's lawsuit retrieved nearly $150 million for United States taxpayers. We need to support efforts by people like Mr. West to ensure that American citizens are empowered to take on corporate wrongdoing. The written testimony of our witnesses on the second panel also makes clear that we need better coordination between State Medicaid programs and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to reduce duplicative efforts and better align resources. Fortunately, the Affordable Care Act provides additional funding to fight waste, fraud, and abuse in Medicaid. It also contains a number of provisions designed to improve data quality and promote data sharing between Federal agencies, the States, and health care providers. The fight against unscrupulous companies like Maxim Health Care Services requires more resources, not less. When we invest in fraud prevention, government spending more than pays for itself. That is one reason why repealing the Affordable Care Act and cutting Medicaid's enforcement budget would be very short-sighted and, indeed, counterproductive. I look forward to the testimony of our witnesses today, and I hope their recommendations will help reduce fraud, waste, and abuse and create a stronger Medicaid program for those who rely on it. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentleman, and I uh, yield to the gentleman, distinguished gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your leadership on this important subject. Reducing Medicaid and proper payments contributes directly to the long-term health of these essential health care programs. I appreciate our two sub subcommittees holding a hearing on the different anti-fraud programs within HHS and Centers for Medical and Medicaid Services. While HHS and CMS are devoting unprecedented attention to reducing Medicaid fraud, it is clear we must do more to reduce improper payments and protect the economic security of individuals such as Richard West, who have lost benefits temporarily as a result of attacking Medicaid and Medicare fraud. As the written testimony for this hearing makes clear, Congress and the Administration have devoted a great deal of effort to reducing improper payments within the last decade. In 2005, Congress passed the Deficit Reduction Act, which established the Medicaid Integrity Program. The MIP provides States with technical assistance to identify and prevent fraud, which is appropriate since States administer Medicaid. The Deficit Reduction Act also requires CMS to work with Medicaid integrity contractors to ferret out overpayments conduct audits and educate program participants about fraud prevention. CMS uses this and other data for its Medicaid statistical information system, which includes eligibility and claims information across the country. By maintaining a central database, CMS can conduct analyses which identify possible fraud or areas where fraud is likely to occur. It also works with agencies to duplicate best practices and has identified 52 of them that could be replicated all across the country. Despite these laudable efforts, it is clear more can and must be done to reduce fraudulent Medicaid payments. As the testimony of Mr. West today and Robin Page West demonstrates, CMS has not always been responsive to reports of fraud. I look forward to learning more from Ms. Bryce Smith and Mr. Cantrell about what CMS is doing to prevent such negligences from occurring in the future. Ensuring robust implementation of existing policies is essential because CMS also must implement important new reforms enacted under the Affordable Care Act. 
As Ms. Bryce Smith notes in her testimony, the Affordable Care Act, sometimes referred to as Obamacare, significantly strengthens anti-fraud programs. These include elementary reforms such as requiring service providers and suppliers to document orders and referrals. The Affordable Care Act also established the Medicaid Recovery Auditor Contract Program, known as RAC, to create incentives for contractors to reduce fraudulent payments. And in conjunction with Secretary Sebelius' Center for Program Integrity, the Affordable Care Act designed, is designed to identify improper fraud payments before they are issued by CMS. I hope today's testimony illum, uh, illuminates the progress we have already made and additional administrative improvements which would reduce Medicaid fraud. Perhaps we should consider more stringent punishments for companies and individuals who systematically defraud Medicaid, as Mr. West suggests in his testimony, or consider harsher penalties for the management of such companies. Again, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this very important hearing, part of a series of getting at so-called improper payments in the Federal Government, which total $125 billion a year. So there is plenty of work to be done. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Uh, thank uh, all of our witnesses and guests. Uh, your patience while we uh, gave our opening statements, but now we are uh, going to move to why we are really here, and that is to hear from our witnesses. And we are honored in our first uh, panel to have uh, a true patriot, uh, Mr. Richard West, uh, who served our nation not just in uniform uh, during the Vietnam War, which we are all eternally grateful and indebted to you for that service, but also uh, Mr. West's service as a private citizen who saw wrong and uh, sought to correct it, and when the government didn't take action to correct it, he did. And uh, so, Mr. West, we are honored to have you here, along with your attorney, Attorney Paige West, uh, and your son, Adam. Um, as uh, is consistent with the rules of the uh, committee, we need to swear all three of you in before we have your testimony. Uh, Ms. West and uh, Adam, uh, if you would stand and uh, if, uh, raise your right hands, and uh, we will swear all three of you in. Uh, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect. All three witnesses have affirmed the oath. And um, we are going to have, uh, you may be seated, and uh, on behalf of uh, Mr. Richard West to uh, save his voice for uh, questions, we are going to have uh, his son, Adam, uh, read his opening statement. So, Adam, you are, uh, if you are ready, please begin. Thank you, Chairman Platts, Chairman Gowdy, Ranking Member Towns, Ranking Member Davis, and distinguished members of the subcommittees for inviting me to discuss Medicaid fraud. I received home health care and other services through the Community Resources for People with Disabilities Medicaid Waiver Program. As a ventilator, wheelchair, and oxygen-dependent person, I qualified for this government-funded program that provides Medicaid benefits up to 16 hours per day of in-home nursing care. There is a limit on the services of, under this program each month, and benefits may be suspended or reduced if the monthly cap is exceeded. Beginning in March of 2003, I received home health care through Maxim Health Care Services under this program. Maxim billed these home health care services to Medicaid, which paid for them with both State and Federal funds. In September of 2004, I received a letter from the New Jersey Department of Human Services Division of Disability Services, Home and Community Services, telling me that I had exceeded my monthly cap and that my Medicaid services were being temporarily reduced or suspended as a result. This prevented me from obtaining needed dental care. I complained to the State of New Jersey, I complained to Medicaid, and I complained to a social worker who was assigned to me, telling them that Medicaid had been billed for nursing care that I had not received. None of them did anything about it. Since none of the government agencies I had contacted about this did anything, I hired a private attorney, Robin Page West, no relation of Baltimore, Maryland, who filed on my behalf a whistleblower lawsuit under the False Claims Act that triggered an investigation of Maxim. Somebody decided to make a profit on my disability and rip off the government. That was wrong, and the right thing for me to do was to expose it. But because the case was under seal while the government investigated, I couldn't talk about it. Sometimes I had trouble getting nurses, and I suspected word had gotten out that I was a troublemaker. Over the course of the government's investigation, viruses made me severely ill. Each day I sat, when I sat alone in my home and no nurse came, I got sicker and sicker. I was afraid of dying and leaving my son with a big legal mess. I feared that if I were no longer alive, the case might be dismissed. Meanwhile, the government investigation carried on, and investigators kept discovering more and more billing improprieties. Finally, after seven years, the government reached a settlement with Maxim and the case went public, with Maxim paying a civil settlement of approximately $130 million and a criminal fine of approximately $30 million. This was the largest home health care fraud settlement in history, yet Maxim is still permitted to do business with the government and none of his executives went to jail. Details of this settlement are available at www.homehealthcarefraudsettlement.com. 
Maxim was overbilling and underdelivering basic services to America's oldest, sickest, and poorest. The goal, was not, the goal was not to provide better services and products at lower prices, but rather to see if they could take advantage of weak Medicare and Medicaid oversight, to see if Uncle Sam could be ripped off and no one would notice, to see if patients who complained would not be taken seriously or would give up after a few calls to Medicaid. And guess what? They were right. Maxim's game went on for years, and America's taxpayers were systematically ripped off. But not only were taxpayers ripped off, when corporations rip off Medicare and Medicaid, there are other victims besides taxpayers. Maxim took services from people like me. Despite the big monetary settlement, Maxim executives did not go to jail, and the company was not excluded from doing future business with Medicare and Medicaid. The settlement received a lot of news coverage that many folks asked why this was. How is it that a company that takes billions of government dollars it is not entitled to can continue on in business? while a shoplifter of a few hundred dollars worth of merchandise will be sent to jail. It is commendable that the government did take on Maxim, but until corporate executives receive harsher penalties, I do not think we will see the fraud stop. Having the corporation pay some settlement money is just a cost of doing business for the fraudsters. The settlement money does not even come out of their own pockets. Changing that and sending some executives to jail might actually make the fraud stop. How many other companies got away with this same fraud for the last seven years? How many other people saw this and did nothing? How many were afraid of losing their health care for being a troublemaker? That is what happened to me. At this time, I am being told my Medicaid will end because of the settlement. My whistleblower recovery is being paid over eight years, with half of it coming at the end of that period. In the intervening years, it will not be enough to pay for my in-home care. I will go broke or die. This is the price of doing the right thing. Do I know of other companies doing fraud? Yes. Four. Can I tell anyone? No. I can't afford to lose any more services. I thought if you do the right thing that maybe things would work out in the end, but maybe not. I am a Vietnam veteran and never took or asked for any services I didn't need. I lived a productive life and raised my son, Adam R. West. This program allowed me to live in my own home, to see him graduate high school and college, and now he is living on his own. If someone is willing to steal from an old sick vet, I would think my government would help. If I had an HMO, who would help? Should I call their CEO? It took seven years, but I had the full weight of the United States government behind me. Many folks are not as fortunate. I came to this hearing hoping to help Congress help the other people who need help through no fault of their own. Thank you again for inviting me to testify. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. West. Ms. West, if you would like to share your testimony. Thank you, Chairman Platts, Chairman Gowdy, Ranking Member Towns, Ranking Member Davis, and distinguished members of the subcommittees for inviting us to discuss Medicaid fraud. I represented Richard West in the Medicaid fraud lawsuit that resulted in the $150 million settlement with Maxim. For the past 20 years, I have focused on bringing cases such as Mr. West's to recover money the government has lost to fraud. I am also the author of a book on this subject published by the American Bar Association entitled Advising the Ketam Whistleblower. In examining ways to improve oversight and accountability of Medicaid, it is helpful to look at the process we followed in bringing Mr. West's Medicaid fraud lawsuit. As he testified, after Mr. West attempted to bring this matter to the government's attention by contacting the State, the Medicaid program, and his social worker, all to no avail, he turned to a private lawyer. We then brought a lawsuit under the False Claims Act, FCA, which empowers an ordinary person to step into the shoes of the government and sue fraudsters to recover the amount stolen, plus civil penalties and treble damages. The person who sues on behalf of the government, the whistleblower, is known as a ketam relator. Based on a Latin phrase that translates as, he who sues on behalf of the king as well as for himself. The Act provides for a whistleblower reward that in a successful intervened case can range from 15 to 25 percent of the government's recovery. In our case, using records Mr. West had kept, we showed how the number of hours Maxim had billed Medicaid exceeded significantly the number of hours Mr. West received. In addition, we gave the government information Mr. West had learned through discussions with various of his nurses that led him to believe Maxim was doing this on purpose. The FCA provides 60 days for the government to decide whether to intervene in a case, and if it needs more time, it must request it from the court. This is quite different from hotlines that are not accountable for acting on callers' tips within a certain period of time, if at all. The FCA is also different from oversight programs and contractors that exist to identify improper payments and fraud. These cost the government money, sometimes more than they recover. For example, 
CMS's Senior Medicare Patrol Program teaches seniors and others how to review Medicare notices and Medicaid claims for fraud and what to do about it. Over 14 years, from 1997 to 2010, it saved $106 million. But its current annual budget of $9.3 million leads to the question whether it is even saving what it costs. The incentive of earning a False Claims Act whistleblower reward, on the other hand, mobilizes private individuals and their attorneys to do the work without the need for any government programs. The FCA model also outperforms the Medicare Recovery Audit Contractor RAC program, which, although it pays contractors a percentage of the improper payments they recoup, still dips into the recouped funds to pay those contingent fees. Not so with FCA recoveries. Not one dime comes from taxpayers to pay for these recoveries, because the statute allows for recovery of triple damages from the fraudster so that the government can be made whole for the cost not only of the whistleblower rewards, but also the investigation, prosecution, and lost interest over time, not to mention the savings caused by deterrence. There is no doubt that the cases whistleblowers are bringing to the government are of high quality. As shown on this graph, which is based on Department of Justice statistics, recoveries from whistleblower-initiated cases by far outpace those in government-initiated cases. More than 80 percent of the False Claims Act cases now being pursued by the U.S. Department of Justice were initiated by whistleblowers, and the amounts of the recoveries are in the billions each year. In closing, one aspect of Mr. West's case that I would like to highlight is that the waiver program capped his benefits at a monthly amount that, if exceeded, triggered a denial of further Medicaid benefits. So when Mr. West went to the dentist, he was informed that he could not get treatment because he had supposedly exceeded his cap. In most Medicare, Medicaid, or other federal and state health programs, that would not happen because there is no cap that stops benefits from being paid. So even if Medicaid beneficiaries notice suspicious billings, they have no incentive to expend time questioning them because their future Medicaid benefits are not at stake. And this is one reason I believe we have not seen more health care fraud cases initiated by Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries. Thank you again for inviting us to testify. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Ms. Page. We appreciate, again, all three of you being here with us to share your insights um, and the experiences you have had in helping to protect American taxpayer dollars, uh, as well as to ensure citizens like Mr. West get the, the care they need and deserve. Uh, we will now begin uh, questions and uh, would yield to the uh, subcommittee chairman, Mr. Gowdy, for the uh, purpose of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. West, on behalf of all of us, I want to thank you for your service to our country, both on this soul and on foreign soul. We are indebted to you. It strikes me, Mr. West, that you uh, brought this to the attention of every single person that you could reasonably have known to bring it to, and nobody did anything. You had to go get a private lawyer to do what either the State of New Jersey, CMS, or some social worker should have done. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Um, the social worker asked myself if they could back up the billing with paperwork. They said yes. So she had no power to audit or so I took it to the state and the state sat in my living room in August 2003, I told them I was not getting the hours of nursing. They were telling me I'm getting. They did nothing. The person running the program retired. The other person sitting at my dining room table got promoted. And everybody just goes on if people aren't held accountable, both maximum 
in state and federal workers, there's nowhere for me to go. And that's exactly what I want to ask Ms. West. Do you have any uh, criminal practice at all to go along with your civil practice? Have you ever done criminal defense work? Uh, for those of us who were not smart enough to do civil work and had to do criminal work, it's always struck me that nothing gets people's attention quite like the fear of going to prison. And poor folk who steal do go to prison. Rich folk who steal uh, have the corporation pay a fine, and then they continue uh, to participate in the Medicaid program. How in the world does that happen? Microphone. It's much more difficult to prove a criminal case. Uh, the standard is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. It takes a lot of resources to investigate these cases. Well, let me stop you right there. Um, you've got a Vietnam War veteran witness who says that this work was not done on me, and you have a document that says that they were billed for it. I think even I could win that case. I, I mean, I, I, I get that there's a different standard of proof, but it, there's a different standard of proof in all criminal cases. Someone in the government is making the decision of whether to prosecute. Do you know who that is? Do you, do you know who it is? The U.S. That, Attorney's Office. In New Jersey? Yes. So they want their the civil division to reach an agreement, pay a fine, uh, the shareholders pay, none of the corporate executives go to jail, and then they continue as part of the settlement to be able to participate in the Medicaid program. That is as outrageous as anything I have heard in the 11 months I have been here, and I have heard some outrageous things. Let me ask you that. There have been civilizations that have been formed in less than seven years. What, what took seven years for this case to be resolved? The investigation started locally, and then it expanded to the state of New Jersey, then it expanded to the states beyond New Jersey, eventually expanding nationwide. And during that time, there were numerous audits going on of the documents. There, were, there was an independent audit company that was hired to determine what, was a, what type of document uh, qualified as a proper claim and what was an improper claim. Maxim's attorneys were involved every step of the way. They were allowed to have input into this process. And then at the end, uh, because fraud is difficult to quantify, it's, uh, the settlement had to be reached, and it's often likened to making sausage because there are so many elements that have to be brought together that so many people have to agree on. Uh, and that's what also took a long part of the time, is the agreement on the various aspects of the s settlement. And there was a criminal component to it as well. So. And the criminal component went away as part of the civil settlement? Well, or did, did anyone go to jail as a result of this? Uh, my understanding is that there were nine indictments, eight of which were of Maxim employees, not executives, but managers. And did they go to jail? I don't know. My time has expired, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. I yield to uh, the gentleman from Illinois, Ranking Member Danny Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. West, let me again thank you for taking time to come to Capitol Hill to testify. And I also thank you again for your service to this country during the Vietnam War. The Coalition Against Insurance Fraud estimates that 80 percent of health care fraud is committed by providers, 10 percent by consumers, and 10 percent by others, such as insurance companies or their employees. I applaud you for your diligence in maintaining records and keeping such a closed eye on the actual number of hours you were receiving home health services and the number of hours Medicaid was being billed. What I want to ask you is, when you received notice that your, your services that you had reached are gone beyond your monthly cap, and your Medicaid services were being temporarily reduced or suspended. How did you feel when you read that letter or got that information? Um, 
I was in a nursing home, and this program allowed me to live in my own home. And in three months, I knew what they were doing. I have always been an advocate for people with disabilities. And when I got that notice, I knew that it wasn't me. It was all the other people that needed service that were getting um, screwed that they're going to take my service and I'm going to like them. Other people can't do that. <laughs> I'm on a vent oxygen wheelchair and just probably too stubborn and arrogant to give up. But if you're the average person in my position, you can't fight, do you? You're helpless. You're, um, you're being abused. So how I felt, I was being abused, and I needed to stand up for everybody. And you knew that you weren't going to take it sitting down. I started this as an advocate, and through the seven, seven years, it, be, it became more patriotic. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. West, let me ask you, you, you indicate that you have handled any number of cases. What, what is the, the typical client? a person who comes to you with the situation and asks for your assistance? More often it is a person who works in the company <coughs> that is committing the fraud, someone who sees uh, something that seems amiss and they will go to their supervisor and say, hey, why are we doing this? And the supervisor will try to brush it off uh, and oftentimes uh, they will escalate it to another superior, and eventually, oftentimes, they get fired for being nosy, uh, at which point they will come to me or close to the end of that process. So they will come, I mean, they are whistleblowers who themselves have been uh, abused in a way in terms of losing their jobs. Exactly. And also in terms of being asked to do things in the job that they know are not right. And as Mr. West pointed out, uh, many of their coworkers know the same thing, but they won't come forward because they are afraid of losing their jobs and their health care. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My time has expired. Thank the gentleman. I yield myself five minutes for the purpose of questions. And uh, again, um, you know, the uh, case uh, uh, that you share with us, Mr. West, and, and uh, your attorney uh, should not happen. And, and our efforts as uh, focused here is trying to make sure it doesn't happen again in the future. Um, if I understood uh, your written testimony and, and your um, responses here today, when you reached out to the State of New Jersey, Medicaid, social worker, um, that it, other than, I mean, the, the, if I understood with the social worker, it looks like they looked at Maxim's records and said, well, they have got paper to back up you know, saying they provide these services, and they basically took the company's word over your word. Is that a fair statement? Right. Um, and that was the, the social worker uh, asked. Did, did, did the State of New Jersey uh, or Medicaid itself even get to that point, or did they just pretty much do nothing? They did nothing. I wrote to Governor Corazon, Senator Menendez. They sent the paperwork to the same people that were doing nothing. Right. So in addition to your own contacts to 
state and Medicaid. You contacted your elected officials, <coughs> governor, U.S. senator. Yes. They contacted those entities, and still nothing happened. Correct. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's just, uh, as uh, Mr. Gowdy said, just uh, uh, somewhat unbelievable that, you know, here you have a citizen trying to do the right thing and protect uh, taxpayers and, you know, ensure he receives his services, and uh, government collectively failed you terribly. Um, when they were denying your claim of fraud and, and failing to act on it, what was their response as far as how that then related to your care? Uh, because uh, of that fraud, you were be being denied a dental. Were they saying, um, we don't believe you that there is fraud, but we are going to provide you care? Or They don't come out and say, we don't believe you. They just don't. They just didn't do anything. Return your calls. Yeah. Don't answer your letters. Don't respond to your email. You are a um, a burden to them, mm -hmm. creating paperwork for them. It's easier for them to, to do nothing. Just kind of push you to the side. Correct. How, how about on the fact that that fraud was denying your services, um, did they correct that and, and pr ensure that you got the dental care, or um, did Eventually, that continue to? Eventually, I got the dental care. But at that time, I had nursing seven hours a day, seven days a week, and nursing three nights a week totaling 18 hours. I lost those 18 hours for seven years. So if, if you turn off my ventilator, I have a hard time breathing. But if you let me sit there and slowly deteriorate, because I'm not getting the care I need. I, I want to make sure I heard you correctly. While the investigation was going on for seven years, they were denying you the services because saying you were, you know, not entitled to them because of the fraud. Right. Outrageous. Yep. The, um, you know, thank Thank you for persevering and weathering the terrible care uh, and treatment that you received. Uh, Ms. West, um, a question, um, and I am not sure uh, from, uh, as, a, as a lawmaker how our Federal whistleblowers, uh, we are seeking to strengthen the whistleblower protections provided Federal employees, because we want, as you reference that more often than not, it is an employee who comes forward of what they know is going on in their company, their office. Uh, we are trying to strengthen that law. Uh, we have passed uh, legislation out of this committee, out of the full uh, Oversight and Government Reform Committee, and now working for a floor vote to uh, give whistleblowers within the Federal Government more protection. Um, uh, how, if a Federal employee came to you, I assume then they are impacted differently uh, going to you for this type of case um, in bringing for fraud because they are a Federal employee. Is that correct? Historically, in my experience, the government has been less receptive to intervening in whistleblower cases brought by Federal employees. Yeah, they uh, keep it more internal. Um, it is hard for me to understand the reasoning that goes behind how an intervention decision is made. I, I, I don't know why that is. But, but your experience over 20 years is yeah. it's less common for them to it, it's more It is more difficult for them to be accepted as a, an intervened case. So all the more uh, unlikely, given that, for a Federal employee to pursue this type of case because they are less likely to succeed? Yes. Yeah. More difficult, yes. Thank you. My time has expired. I uh, yield to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Towns. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and let me again uh, thank you, uh, Mr. West, you know, for coming and uh, 
and sharing your story with us. And of course, um, I regret that you had to go through so much in order to um, make the point, but uh, we appreciate your time here today. Let me uh, 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 begin by just, can you tell me about the process you went through in trying to contact various agencies? Could you t talk of just a moment in terms about the process that you went through trying to reach agencies? I know you said that you uh, sent out letters and emails and phone calls. I mean, could you just talk about the process just briefly? Um, the local county social worker comes to the house once a month. So once a month, I'm telling her I'm not getting my soap, and I'm calling her in between those visits, saying the nurses aren't showing up. I'm having to depend on family, friends, the state workers, the county workers who get to the state workers, supposedly they didn't follow through. And the state program was telling me I had to have a caregiver in my home for when a nurse didn't show up. My son was in high school getting ready to graduate. I wasn't about to put that burden on him because the nursing aide wasn't doing their job. So the state decided they wanted to have a meeting in my home. So they all come down, sit at my table, and tell me what services I'm getting. And I said, I am not getting the hours of nursing you are telling me I'm getting. And the state worker said, well, you need a caregiver and you don't have one. So maybe you don't qualify for the program. And I said, I'm not going to have a caregiver. And she said, you're not compliant. And I said, arrest me. She didn't appreciate that. Right. And the county social worker told her, there is a discrepancy in the hours. They all got up, went out, had a powwow out by the car and went back to Trenton and never followed through on anything. When I realized the county and the state wouldn't do anything, I went to the Medicaid fraud hotline, called them. They said, well, give us your social and we'll look into it. Never heard a word. So I figured I have to get out of the state of New Jersey because I have no idea who's involved, right. whether they're involved with Maxim or their own program. So I went on the web looked up Medicaid fraud. That's when I found out there is a whistleblower's lawsuit. I had no idea. Then I read you could receive a portion of re recovery. I figured, well, oh, hey, I can fix my van. Maybe I'll get 5000 dollars. And the first person I called was in Alabama. 
of whistleblowers, honey. He said, well, if it's not $10 million, I don't even want to talk to you. I told the uh, whistleblower lawyer in California, he said, send me the documentation you have. I did. He told me back. He said, I think you have a pretty good case, but you need an attorney closer to where you're at. Then I found Robin on the internet, and that's how we proceeded. So you found someone with the same last name, huh? <laughs> when I called, her secretary said, who's calling us? Richard West. And there was a silence and there was no relation. <laughs> Right. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, let's, let's ask for an uh, additional 30 seconds. I want to ask Ms. Page um, uh, to uh, submit some, uh, something to us. You know, in your written testimony, um, you indicated that False Claim Act is both unusual and effective in uncovering fraud in the health care system. Uh, if you would be kind enough in writing to summarize your top three arguments uh, for why this law is effective. And so I'm interested in that because we would like to strengthen or to improve it. So if you would be kind enough to submit that to us in writing, being my time is out, the you know, I would. Three uh, reasons why it's effective. Yes. Right. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Uh, gentleman, Mr. Desjardins is recognized for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. West. Admiral Mullins this past year was quoted as saying the biggest threat to our national security is our national debt. So not only did you fight for our country in Vietnam, you are fighting for our country again against a big threat, which is uh, spending and debt. So I applaud you for your courage and taking the time to come here and speak with us today. Um, I just wanted to ask you a few questions about your relationship with the people that spent a t lot of time caring for you, because with your condition, with the uh, trach ventilator, I'm assuming you had a respiratory therapist that came to your home? No? You had uh, home health nurses? I had nursing. Okay. And then oh, I'm assuming you had nurses' aides to help with activities of daily living. They have to help you dress. Right. They have to help you eat. They have to help maintain your residence so it's yeah. safe. And so that they spend quite a bit of time in your home. Correct. Did you ever feel like you got close to any of these people? I mean, they take care of you. Were they, were they caring people? Did you uh, talk to them on a first-name basis? Did, did anyone, say, a, an aide stay with you for uh, several months at a time, or was it different aides on different days? I have a nurse now that has been with me four years. Over the course of the seven years, there has been different nurses, different agencies, but many have been there for extended time. So you knew them very well and they knew you very well and it was generally friendly and cordial. I mean, did you like them and they liked you? Yes. Okay. When, when you first started noticing the fraud, were you able to talk to them about this and, and share your concerns? They were part. I'm sorry? They were part of the fraud. Did, did you talk to them and ask them, did they try to make excuses or did they say they talked to their managers? Um, no, I, I could tell by what they were saying, what they were telling me, they were being paid, that they weren't um, putting in for the hours in my home, they were putting in for additional hours, and the company, the nurses told me on several occasions that the maximum uh, office managers 
work on a bonus system. So the more profitable they are, the bigger the bonus. Okay. So these people, despite having a relationship, you liked them, they liked you, you felt they were aware of the fraud that was going on but would do nothing? They knew. They knew. They knew. Did you feel like you were betraying them, in a sense, when you had to uh, go over their head to try to, to fix this situation? No, you can't, you can't betray somebody that is okay. abusing you. Okay. Well, I guess I just wonder, you know, how unusual you are. Mrs. West, how many other uh, Medicaid beneficiaries have come to you, such as Mr. West? Um, I mean, how unusual is Mr. It's West? Is this com very unusual for someone just to do this? Just a handful of people have even inquired, and if memory serves, uh, Mr. West is the only beneficiary case that I've taken. Okay. So given the success by whistleblowers, why do uh, agencies and officials typically ignore people like Mr. West? What would be your opinion on that? Um, I don't think it's uh, so much that the False Claims Act isn't serving them and that the government isn't picking up the cases. I think it's that there are not that many beneficiaries who are coming to the False Claims Act attorneys. Okay. So why then, when someone like Mr. West, uh, who obviously has a legitimate claim and it was proven legitimate, why do you think Medicare just chose to ignore it? And I will ask you that and ask Mr. West that. Well, I think Mr. West is an extremely unusual uh, person. Uh, relators need to be very tenacious, very intelligent, uh, very persistent, and Quite often, Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries who are sick cannot bring all those qualities and have the stamina to, you know, figure it all out and bring it to a lawyer. And I think that's basically the issue: is that um, they are not aware of it, they're not aware of the incentives, and they don't necessarily have the skill set to put it all together and follow through on it. Okay, well, I will just say, and I know I am about out of time, if you will indulge me for a few seconds. As a practicing physician, a primary care physician for 18 years before coming to Congress, I dealt closely with home health. There was a lot of issues of fraud and abuse in the 90s where people who did not have near your level of disabilities had AIDS and whatnot coming to the House. Uh, that was kind of reined in a little bit in the 90s, but I see that uh, it, it tends to be alive and well as we moved into the next decade as well. So, yeah, again, I applaud you, Mr. West, for your efforts. And clearly, I think that uh, CMS and Medicare, who we will have on the next panel, will get an opportunity to see why uh, people like yourself are being ignored. And thank you so much for stepping forward and, and fighting again for your country. Thank I yield you. back. Right, thank you, gentlemen. that people in my position don't have the support once they turn people in. If I was um, a government informant for a mob-related case, you would take care of me. But when I went to the special agent in charge and asked to get nursing, so I could continue through this case. There was nothing he could do to help me. So why would most people turn somebody in knowing they could die? So you have to give support to the patient, client, or whatever you want to call me, so he can bring the lawsuit. If the threat is you complain, we take your services, where is the incentive? There isn't. So, uh, thank the gentleman and, and Mr. West. Uh, Along the lines of what you just expressed, it sounds as if, um, whether through the need for legislative change or regulatory change, that if you have a beneficiary, as in this case, that the government makes a determination they are going to take on the case, 
uh, and go forward, that that decision should may, maybe include a um, provision you know, that while the case is being pursued, one year or seven years, in your case, you are given the services on a provisional basis um, you know, Correct. while it is proceeding. Because, other, again, otherwise you have a disincentive from reporting it right. because of being at risk of further losing care. So. Correct. Okay. Thanks, gentlemen. And I yield to the distinguished ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Cummings from Maryland. Mr. West, I uh, thank you also for being here. And I agree with you. These folks uh, needed to go to jail. And it is interesting that I have now done a little research to see what happened. I want to follow up on some of Mr. Gowdy's concerns. Um, they did go to jail. One went to jail uh, from Maxim. And uh, he got, this was the highest sentence of, of, of eight or nine people, five months in prison and five months of home confinement. Most of them got some, a fine and home imprisonment. That's what they got. Now, 40 miles away from here, I represent Baltimore. And about six months ago, I had literally thousands, thousands of young African-American boys many of whom may have stolen a bike, may have done something wrong with drugs or whatever, and they got a record, Mr. West. They got a record. And you know, when, you, know, you know what? They can't get a job. They will not, if they live to be 99 years old, they will not be able to get a job. But here we have Maxim, a company that has basically stolen, stolen from the American people. Maxim, a company that has taken away the services not only from you, but so many others, but yet and still they are in a position to continue to make millions. Something is absolutely wrong with that picture. And I agree with you. And when the people from CMS and the IG come up, they have got to explain to us. And by the way, every member of this panel, every member of this Congress should be saying Maxim should be put out of business with regard to doing business with the Federal Government. It is ridiculous how a young man in Baltimore can steal a $300 bike and not be able to get a job for a lifetime, but Maxim can steal millions and continue to do the same thing over and over again. Yeah, they got sentenced, but this sentence is simply a slap on the wrist. If you can pay a $150 million fine, this is just, this is just the cost of business. And so, you know, I'm very concerned about this, and I'm gonna, I want to enter into the record, Mr. Chairman, a, the United States Attorney's Office, District of New Jersey, it's basically their summary of the sentencing. Uh, it's dated November 12, 21, 2011. I would ask that that be made a part of the record. Without objection, it's so done. And a Reuters article dated, I ask that this be made a part of the record too, dated Monday, September 12, 2011. And it says in part, Maxim settled with the United States Department of Justice in 41 states. Their company entered into a deferred prosecution agreement with the Justice Department under which it, pay, it will pay a $20 million fine. If Maxim meets the agreement's requirements, it will avoid charges. And the, the, the government said it was willing to enter into an agreement with Maxim in part, in part because of its cooperation and significant personnel changes it has made since 2009. Well, that's all well and good. Without objection, entered in the record. Thank you very much. Well, that's all well and good, but if you're paying people bonuses to screw people and mess, mess them over, and you're right, everybody's not like you. There are people who are sitting in wheelchairs right now, looking at this right now, who feel helpless, and they're going, and many of them are going to die. That's why I cannot understand, for the life of me, how every member of this Congress should not want to put Maxim out of business, at least with regard to its business with the Federal Government. Now to you, Ms. West. Ms. West, you stated in your written testimony that you have over 20 years of experience in bringing cases such as Mr. West's to the government's attention. Can you explain how these False Claims Act cases help government work better and save taxpayer dollars? I am sorry, I didn't mean to get so upset, but this makes me want to vomit. Go ahead. This False Claims Act gives the government a bird's eye view into the fraud. Uh, without the whistleblowers, the government really has no way of knowing how the fraud is being committed. Every time there is a fraud that is detected, 
the government learns about it, comes in, kind of shuts it down. But then there's a new fraud that pops up. And it's a constant, never-ending thing. There's more creativity behind fraud because there's so much money to be made by it. And that's why the False Claims Act is so effective, is because it reaches out to the people who are seeing the fraud and understand the fraud and giving them an incentive to tell about it and explain to the government, you know, how to stop it. And Ms. West, do you think there are too many False Claim Act lawsuits? And what disincentives are there for bringing a frivolous false claim lawsuit? Well, the disincentive for bringing a frivolous False Claims Act lawsuit is there is a provision in the statute that allows the defendant to recover its attorney's fees from the relator if it is shown that the suit was brought for purposes of harassment. Uh, in addition, it is difficult to bring a frivolous lawsuit because the KETAM lawyers work on contingency, and if we don't think a case is really good, we are not going to bring it. Only about 20 percent of the False Claims Act cases brought are intervened in by the government. So we are looking at a very tiny window, and we are looking for the very best cases to bring to the government's attention. I see my time has expired. Again, Mr. West, I want to thank you very much for you and all others who will benefit from what you are doing. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Uh, before yielding to the gentleman from Virginia, um, Ms. West, if um, the, the example of having a bird's eye view, the beneficiary, those out in the front lines being able to bring a False Claims Act. Um, in, the, in the second uh, panel, we are going to hear about a lot of expenditure of monies for new technology, new analytical programs and things. Is it a fair statement to characterize your experience here that um, rather than the investment of all this money in new programs, if we had simply better listened to the beneficiary, we would have prevented the fraud? Yes, I think so. And listen to Malcolm Sparrow, who has analyzed this and, and feels that the money should not be paid out first. It should be paid out properly, not paid out, and then followed after to be gotten back. Right. So uh, if being more upfront as opposed to recovery type audits, you know, it is focus up front. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yield to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for the purpose of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank Mr. West particularly for his courage, both serving his country and in serving his country a second time in trying to make sure a taxpayer's uh, investments are protected and uh, made secure and for the courage of persisting when many others might have been daunted and discouraged. I also want to say to our colleague, uh, if he is still here, I, I guess Mr. Gotti isn't here, but if Mr. Gotti is serious about toughening up the criminal penalties, he will find allies on this side of the aisle. Um, our subcommittee has pointed out that there are every year $125 billion in improper payments. Now, sometimes it is innocent, you know, a mistaken billing. Somebody gets paid who shouldn't have or gets double paid. Somebody who is not qualified to receive a benefit gets a benefit. But a lot of it is fraud. Um, I know that U.S. attorneys' offices are consumed with Medicare and Medicaid fraud. The U.S. attorneys' office in Boston just announced a $3 billion recovery. That is one out of 99 U.S. attorneys' offices. So we know it is out there. If we eliminated improper payments, by the way, we could give a Christmas gift to the super committee uh, of $1.25 trillion over the next 10 years without breaking a sweat, without affecting anyone's benefits, without having political drama. Uh, without yield? having to gut any you know, necessary investments. Um, uh, I, thank the I yield to the Chair. Thank the gentleman for yielding. As you well state, if you took the fraud uh, of improper payments, and again, we don't know how much is right. fraud, but improper payments of Medicaid, as we are just discussing here today, and as you know from our previous hearing on Medicare, these two programs alone account for about $70 billion a year of that 125. So over 10 years, you are talking $700 billion. Uh, so right, uh, right on point. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, um, and of course, as you know, some of that money was cited in the financing of the Affordable uh, Health Care Act, even though some criticized us for that as if we were gutting the program. But in fact, we were simply trying to recover either improperly pay made payments or illicitly made payments. Um, I, I want to just make sure we get the narrative on the record, um, Ms. West, if you don't mind. Uh, I, I've heard Mr. West. Um, uh, when, was, when did Mr. West first discover something was wrong and how? 
He testified. If you could speak into the microphone. Three months after he came out of the nursing home, he realized something was wrong. And what, what made him realize something was wrong? That he was not getting the care that he was entitled to get under the program. He was getting fewer hours of nursing care. Okay. And maybe initially he thought that was a mistake. Initially, I thought they were at a hard time servicing my case, but then it became apparent right. that they would send okay. when they wanted, who they wanted. Well, the, te the testimony submitted on your behalf by your attorney, Ms. West, says, you attempted to bring the matter to the government's attention by contacting the state. What state was that? State of New Jersey Division. Of New Jersey. The Medicaid program itself. So you went to a right. local office, okay? And your social worker. Correct. And the, and the testimony says all to no avail. Correct. Meaning what? They ignored it. Yes. Okay. Um, so you then decided this isn't right. I'm not getting anywhere, and I'm therefore going to turn to a private attorney. And you used actually something Congress did well, the False Claims Act, Correct. which gave you a, a vehicle for redress uh, as a, as you put it, qui tam relator. Okay. Correct. Um, what was, Ms. West, if you could describe for us, what was the reaction of the Medicaid uh, officialdom? when faced with this potential fraud, at least on your initial contacts? Are you asking? Yes, I'm asking you, Ms. West. I did not contact Medicaid. I filed a lawsuit under the False Claims Act. And so my first contact was with the U.S. Attorney's Office okay. in the District of New Jersey. Gotcha. Did Medicaid at any point react to the filing of the lawsuit or the claims contained therein? Again, I didn't have any contact with anyone from Medicaid. I was coming in through the Department of Justice. Did your client have any contact with Medicaid in terms of reaction to the filing of the lawsuit or the claims therein? Well, once we file the lawsuit, it's under seal, and we aren't allowed to talk about it. And Even with Medicaid? Not unless there would be a partial lifting of the seal or if they would set up a meeting and Medicaid officials would be there, but there was nothing like that. And Presumably, you made repeated attempts with the Medicaid office, Mr. West, and I know my time is running out, uh, to, uh, to try to alert them to this and get them to act. Yes. And they were indifferent. Correct. We look forward to their testimony. Thank you. My time has run out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman for going back. Um, before we conclude, uh, you yield myself just a, a final minute. and. Uh, Mr. West, my understanding is uh, you were, uh, in giving an interview, you shared an example of the lack of cooperation you got as you tried to correct this, and, and that you were in front of a judge or an adjudicative setting where uh, you were told that, well, there is evidence that they did provide these services and they were not agreeing with you or believing you, and that you made the statement that you would bet that while you were in front of this individual, that Maxim was probably falsely billing for services to you. Could you, could you share that? We went to Trenton to federal courthouse. I picked up Robin at the train station. We met with, I believe the press was Silverman. And a um, special agent, and after they heard my story, I said, I'll bet Maxim bills for a nurse in my home while I'm sitting here with you. I left my home at quarter to seven in the morning. My son was right. Went to Trenton, met with the prosecutors. I said, I'll bet they bill for this time. And they were 
in January I sent an email to Robin that said, I told you so, they built for seven to three for an RN in my home. Me and Adam did get home till about five that night. They also built the same nurse Christmas Day. We were in Pennsylvania. The next stayed over, and this particular nurse was reading my mail, looking at my email. I had to tell my attorney, do not send anything to my home, all updates. In the email, don't mention who they're from or who they're about. I lived in a closet because I couldn't. I had people spying on me yep. in my home while they were stealing from you. One more example of how you were being victimized by uh, a uh, very unscrupulous company. Yep. And, uh, and its employees. And uh, the fact that while you are sitting with the very investigators, you know, they are falsely billing for services to you just epitomizes the outrageousness of, of this case. Right. And uh, again, as you referenced, having left your home at quarter or seven in the morning and not getting back till five o'clock, uh, another example of your persistency and willingness to do whatever it took to bring justice on behalf of the American people, taxpayers, and to ensure that you were properly provided the services you have earned and deserved, especially as a veteran of our Nation's Armed Forces. Um, I thank each of you again for your testimony here today, but more so than just your testimony here today, your efforts over almost a decade of uh, trying to bring uh, justice uh, on behalf of your fellow citizens. And, uh, Adam, I, I, I think it probably goes without me saying, but I, I imagine you are a, a very proud son. Uh, to be uh, Richard West's son and uh, you know, know that uh, he is a true servant of this nation. So uh, God bless each and every one of you. And we will recess for five minutes uh, while we reset for the second panel. May I have one minute? Yeah, yes, you may. Uh, Today is Pearl Harbor Day. And I would like to say my dad, Thomas L. West, served in the Pacific. My mom, Catherine B. West, worked in a factory during that war. We had a country that worked together for the country. We need that now. We need people like me, people like you to sit down and fix the government. Well stated, Mr. West. Uh, Thank you. you. I am honored to be here. Yeah. God bless you. Thank you. Stand in recess. Well.
also turn green. Hearing is reconvened, and uh, we thank our second panel of witnesses for being with us. And again, uh, your knowledge and uh, insights to help educate uh, both of our subcommittees on this important topic of how do we prevent and detect and recover um, American taxpayers' dollars uh, that have been defrauded uh, through the Medicaid program. Uh, we are delighted to have four witnesses with us. Uh, first, Ms. Angela Bryce Smith, Director of the Medicaid Integrity Group at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Mr. Gary Cantrell, Assistant Inspector General for Investigations at the Office of the Inspector General for Health and Human Services. Ms. Carolyn Yocum, Director of Health Care at the Government Accountability Office. And Ms. Valerie Melvin, Director of Information Management and Technology Resource Issues at the Government Accountability Office. We thank each of you for being with us. And uh, again, as is pursuant to the committee rules, if I could ask each of you to stand and raise your right hand, we will swear, in, swear you in before your testimony. Okay. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay. Thank you. You may be seated. And the clerk will uh, reflect that uh, all four witnesses affirmed that oath. And um, we will, um, again, uh, we, we have had a chance of reviewing your written testimony and appreciate uh, your providing that to us. It allows us to be a little better prepared for today's hearing. Uh, and uh, we will set the clock for roughly five minutes uh, for your uh, oral testimony here today. And Ms. Bryce Smith, if you would begin. Thank you, Chairman Platts and Gowdy, Ranking Members Towns and Davis, and members of the subcommittees. Thank you for the invitation to discuss the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services efforts to reduce fraud, waste, and abuse in the Medicaid program. Medicaid is the primary source of medical assistance for 56 <coughs> million low-income and disabled Americans. Although the Federal Government establishes requirements for the program, States design, implement, administer, and oversee their own Medicaid programs. The Federal Government and States share in the cost of the program. State governments have a great deal of programmatic flexibility within which to tailor their Medicaid programs. As a result, there is variation among the states in eligibility, services, reimbursement rates, and approaches to program integrity. Prior to 2005, states were solely responsible for the oversight of their Medicaid program. However, in 2005, with the passage of the Deficit Reduction Act, Congress recognized the need for a greater focus on health care fraud and gave CMS new authority and funding to establish the Medicaid Integrity Program. I am the director of the Medicaid Integrity Group, which implements the Medicaid Integrity Program. The Medicaid Integrity Program is a Federal effort to prevent, identify, and recover inappropriate Medicaid payments. It also supports the program integrity efforts of the State Medicaid agencies through a combination of oversight and technical assistance. The establishment of the Medicaid Integrity Program began a new era of combating waste and fraud in the Medicaid program, which was once again improved by the creation of the Center for Program Integrity. The Center for Program Integrity brings a coordinated approach to program integrity across all Federal health care programs. This new focus on program integrity and anti-fraud efforts continue with the Affordable Care Act, which is the most comprehensive legislative step forward to fight health care fraud in over a decade. 
The administration has made an unprecedented investment to reduce improper payments, invest in program integrity strategies, and rein in waste, fraud, and abuse in Federal health care programs. Our efforts within the Medicaid Integrity Program focus on protecting Medicaid resources at the beneficiary level, the State level, and the National level. Beneficiary involvement is a key component to all of CMS's anti-fraud efforts. We strongly believe that alert and vigilant beneficiaries are one of the most valuable tools in our efforts to stop fraudulent activity. We are committed to enlisting beneficiaries in our fight against fraud in several ways. For example, we, our Education Medicaid Integrity Contractor, or MIC, pro provide beneficiaries with quick facts and tips on how to prevent, spot, and report Medicaid fraud through social network sites, through electronic uh, letters, through public service announcements, and other education materials. We encourage Medicaid beneficiaries to report suspected fraud, waste, and abuse to their State's Medicaid Fraud Control Unit or Medicaid Agency or the HH Fraud Tips Hotline as examples. CMS is also committed to supporting our State partners in their program integrity efforts and their efforts to reduce improper payments. Our Medicaid Integrity Institute provides substantive training and support to the States. We have trained more than 2,600 program integrity staff from all 50 States, D.C. and Puerto Rico. CMS provides boots on the ground teams that can assist States with special investigative audits and emerging threats. Since October 2007, CMS has participated in 10 projects in three States which have resulted in $33.2 million in savings through cost avoidance. In addition, CMS's review and audit mix or Medicaid integrity contractors complement and support program integrity efforts underway in the States. Between 2009 and November 1st of, of this year, the audit mix have initiated 1,663 audits in 44 States. In addition to the Federal audits, States report that they have recovered $2.3 billion as a result of all Medicaid program integrity activities. The Affordable Care Act has also strengthened Federal oversight for the Medicaid program by providing new tools to CMS and law enforcement officials to protect Federal health care programs from fraud, waste, and abuse. These tools include the new screening and enrollment requirements, strengthened authority to, to suspend potentially fraudulent payments and increased coordination of anti-fraud actions and policies between Medicare and Medicaid. The Affordable Care Act expanded the recovery audit contractors to Medicaid, which will help States identify and recover improper Medicaid payments. Over the next five years, we project that the Medicaid RAC effort will save the Medicaid program $2.1 billion, of which $910 million will be returned to the States. CMS is committed to working with and sharing with our law enforcement partners who take a lead in investigating, determining, and prosecuting alleged fraud. We also continue to work to address the concerns raised by the GAO that could reduce improper payments and potential vulnerabilities in the Medicaid program. I am happy to announce that the fiscal year 2011 Medicaid's national improper payment rate is 8.1 percent a drop from the 9.4 percent in fiscal year 2010. Despite this decrease, we remain focused on improving program integrity in Medicaid and are confident that the actions outlined today and in my written testimony, as well as the continued efforts of our Federal, State, and public partners will continue to reduce improper payments. I look forward to working with the subcommittee to ensure that CMS carries out this important work. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bryce Smith. Uh, Mr. Cantrell. Good morning, Chairman, Ranking Members, and other distinguished members of the Committee. I am Gary Cantrell, Assistant Inspector General for Investigations with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Office of Inspector General. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today about our efforts to combat Medicaid fraud. First and foremost, I would like to thank Mr. West for coming forward with allegations of billing fraud on the part of Maxim Healthcare Services. OIG recognizes that our success is dependent upon cooperation with courageous individuals like Mr. West. The documentation he provided was critical to us in helping us unravel a broader scheme within Maxim Healthcare that spanned across the nation. <clears throat> our investigation resulted in Maxim agreeing to pay more than $150 million to resolve civil and criminal allegations of fraud, the largest ever settlement relating to home health services. 
nine individuals, including three senior managers, also pled guilty to felony charges. This example highlights the potential for citizens and government to collaborate and curtail schemes that are harming the Nation's most vulnerable citizens. OIG encourages citizens to report suspected fraud so we can investigate and bring to justice those responsible. Medicaid fraud drains vital Federal and State program dollars. That harms both recipients relying on those services as well as the American taxpayers. OIG has a team of over 480 highly skilled criminal investigators located throughout the country. And in fiscal year 2011, our enforcement efforts resulted in record numbers that included over 720 criminal convictions and $4.6 billion in expected recoveries. Nearly 400 of these actions address schemes related to Medicaid fraud, and over $1.1 billion is expected to be returned to the program. The types of schemes perpetrated in the Medicaid program in many ways mirror Medicare fraud schemes. For example, we see billing for services not rendered, medical identity theft, false statements, bribery and kickbacks. These have been especially common in relation to home health, prescription drugs, durable medical equipment and transportation services. Data access is critical to our enforcement efforts in both Medicare and Medicaid. OIG has worked closely with CMS to expand our access to national Medicare claims data. This improved access has enabled OIG to more effectively identify Medicare fraud trends, and that allows our agents to more efficiently investigate allegations of fraud. Unfortunately, this is not the case on the Medicaid side. Our inability to access timely, comprehensive data impedes effective oversight of the program. CMS's Medicaid Statistical Information System is the only source of nationwide Medicaid claims data, and weaknesses in the system limit its usefulness for effective oversight and monitoring of the program. For example, the system does not capture many of the data elements necessary for us to detect fraud, waste and abuse. As in the Maxim case, Medicaid presents our investigators with unique data challenges. Why? It is because the data does not exist in a single location. Rather, it exists in independent systems across 50 states and the District of Columbia. We understand that CMS is taking steps to collect more timely, comprehensive data from the states, and we hope they move quickly to accomplish this goal. State Medicaid fraud control units have been valuable partners in our investigative efforts. Our number of joint investigations has nearly doubled over the last five years. And to improve on our success, we believe that Medicaid fraud control units could also benefit from enhanced analytic capabilities with regard to their State Medicaid data. This will lead to improved oversight and enforcement. In closing, we need to make a lasting impact on Medicaid fraud. The need has never been more important. The Congressional Budget Office estimates that in 2014, 16 million new recipients will be added to the Medicaid program. Therefore, it is especially critical that OIG have access to timely, comprehensive data in order to protect these Federal and State dollars. Together, we must work to eliminate vulnerabilities and ensure that we are positioned to effectively oversee this program for years to come. Thank you for your support of our mission, and I would be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Mr. Cantrell. Ms. Yoakum. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Members, and members of these subcommittees, I am pleased to be here as you discuss improper payments and fraud in the Medicaid program. My remarks today will focus on an important challenge as well as opportunities that CMS faces given its expanded role in Medicaid program integrity. In 2005, GAO testified that CMS needed to increase its commitment to helping states fight Medicaid fraud, waste and abuse. That year, Congress passed the Deficit Reduction Act which provided for the creation of the Medicaid Integrity Program and other provisions. The Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act gave CMS and states added responsibilities and new oversight tools. Thus, CMS is spending for and attention to Medicaid Program Integrity activities has grown, primarily through the creation of the Medicaid Integrity Group, or the MIG. The MIG gradually hired staff and contractors to implement a set of core activities such as reviewing and auditing Medicaid provider claims and providing education to State officials and Medicaid providers. In 2005, CMS had approximately eight staff years focused on program integrity. 
Today, it has over 80 of the 100 statutorily required positions authorized in the DRA. However, more is not necessarily better. A key challenge faced by the MIG is the need to avoid duplication of federal and state program integrity efforts, particularly in auditing provider claims, which has been primarily a state function. The amount of overpayments that the MIG identifies is not commensurate with its costs or with amounts identified by some states. For example, in a similar number of audits, New York reported identifying more than $372 million in overpayments, compared with $15 million identified through the national provider audits. In 2011, the MIG reported plans to redesign its national provider audit program to allow for greater coordination with states on data, policies, and audit measures. While it remains to be seen whether these changes would help identify additional overpayments, the proposed redesign appears promising. In particular, the collaborative projects currently underway in 13 states would first allow states to augment their own resources, second, address audit targets that states had too few resources to handle, and third, assist states with less analytic capability. These projects could help avoid duplication as well as strengthen federal and state efforts. CMS's expanded role also offers the opportunity to enhance state program integrity efforts, but more consistent data are needed. For example, two core activities of the MIG, triennial comprehensive reviews and annual assessments, collect similar information, such as states' program integrity planning, prevention activities, and recoveries. However, some of the data that states report show implausible and or inconsistent state responses. Improved data would allow CMS to further target its assistance to states through the MIG's primary training initiative, the Medicaid Integrity Institute. Not only is the training offered at no cost to states, but such venues provide opportunities for state program integrity officials to develop relationships with their counterparts in other states. Such relationships are critical in a program like Medicaid, where providers and beneficiaries can cross state lines and repeat improper or even fraudulent behaviors. Since fiscal year 2008, the Institute has trained over 2,200 state employees. Institute expenditures are a small portion of MIG spending, just $1.3 million of its $75 million budget, yet they could greatly increase networks across state and disseminate best practices for ensuring appropriate payments in Medicaid. For many years, Medicaid has been a critical part of the health care safety net, providing health care services to some of our nation's most vulnerable populations. This heightens CMS's responsibility to ensure that billions of program dollars are appropriately sent. In these difficult economic times, it creates an even greater imperative. The challenges of coordination are significant for states and for CMS. No less significant is the need for improved data to prevent overpayments. But there is also an opportunity for the MIG to work with states to disseminate and improve oversight of program spending and hopefully decrease the level of improper payments. This concludes my prepared remarks. I would be happy to answer any questions you or members of the subcommittees may have. Thank you, Ms. Yoakum. Uh, Ms. Melvin? Chairman Platts and Gowdy, Ranking Members Townsend Davis, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify at today's hearing on fraud and improper payments in the Medicaid program. At your request, my testimony will summarize findings from a report that we issued earlier this year on CMS's efforts to protect the integrity of the Medicare and Medicaid programs through the use of information technology. Specifically, on June, in June 2011, we reported on two programs that CMS initiated in 2006 to help improve the ability to detect fraud, waste, and abuse. The Integrated Data Repository, or IDR, which is intended to provide a single source of data on Medicare and Medicaid claims, and the One Program Integrity, a One PI system, a web-based portal that is to provide CMS staff and contractors with a single source of access to the data contained in IDR as well as tools for analyzing that data. Our work examined the extent to which IDR and 1PI had been developed and implemented, as well as CMS's efforts to identify, measure, and track benefits from resulting from these programs. 
We also provided recommendations on actions CMS should take to achieve its goals of reduced fraud and waste. Regarding IDR, we noted that this data repository had been in use since 2006. However, it did not include all of the data that were planned to be in the system by 2010. For example, IDR included most types of Medicare claims data, but no Medicaid data. IDR also did not include data from other CMS systems that can help analysts prevent improper payments. Moreover, CMS had not finalized plans or developed reliable schedules for efforts to incorporate these data. Further, while one PI had been developed and deployed, we found that few analysts were trained in using the system. Program officials had planned for 639 analysts to be using the system by the end of fiscal year 2010. However, as of October 2010, only, 40, only 41 were actively using the portal and tools. None of these users included Medicaid program integrity analysts. We pointed out that until program officials finalize plans and schedules for training and expanding the use of 1PI, the agency may continue to experience delays. With 1PI, CMS anticipated that it would achieve financial benefits of about $21 billion. As we have previously reported, agencies should forecast expected benefits and then measure the actual results accrued through the implementation of programs. However, CMS was not positioned to do this. As a result, it was unknown whether the program had provided any financial benefits. CMS officials told us that it was too early to determine whether the program had provided benefits since it had not met its goals for widespread use. To help ensure that the development and implementation of IDR and 1PI are successful in helping CMS meet the goals of its program integrity initiatives and possibly save tens of billions of dollars, we made several recommendations to CMS. Among our recommendations was that the agency finalize plans and schedules for incorporating additional data into IDR, finalize plans and schedules for training all program integrity analysts intended to use 1PI, and establish and track outcome-based performance measures that gauge progress toward meeting program goals. In commenting on a draft of our report, CMS agreed with our recommendations. The agency's timely implementation of these recommendations could lead to reduced fraud and waste and overall substantial savings in the Medicare and Medicaid programs. This concludes my oral statement. I look forward to addressing your questions. Thank you, Ms. Melvin. Uh, we'll begin questions. I will yield myself uh, five minutes to begin this uh, round of questions. And I uh, certainly appreciate all four of you, your testimony and uh, your efforts in regard to protecting American taxpayer funds uh, and ensuring that we are properly caring for and providing services. Um, Ms. Bryce Smith, I am going to begin with you. And I, I certainly appreciate the, the breadth and depth of your testimony on what we are trying to do. Uh, I have to be honest with you uh, that I am surprised after hearing the testimony of Mr. West that as a representative of CMS, you did not acknowledge how badly we failed him and uh, how I believe CMS, specifically our government in total, owes him an apology. And um, I worry that that is uh, a sign of trouble for us in trying to address this issue. Because we can have great programs in place, but if we are not listening to the beneficiaries, I mean, having a hotline is great. Teaching beneficiaries how to detect and report fraud is great. He did, and we didn't do anything in response. So I, I, I do have to express that I was disappointed uh, that you did not acknowledge what he went through to make sure that we, as a government, did right by the taxpayers and by him. Because if he was denied services, how many other citizens are out there who are being denied services because of fraudulent conduct. So uh, more of a statement there than a question, I guess. But uh, specific to his case is, uh, to the best of your knowledge, has CMS begun uh, and conducted any investigation of why we did not heed Mr. West's you know, claims of fraud and that it resorted to him hiring a private attorney to have it investigated? When I heard Mr. West's story, I was very much touched by what he said. Um, and I was trying to figure out what 
was the root cause and how did that happen. But when he said that he communicated with State officials, um, I felt like that was appropriate. Medicaid is run by the States. And he indicated he spoke with local people. That was in 2004. And as uh, Ms. Melvin indicated, we had less than <coughs> six full-time equivalents that even there was no Medicaid integrity group back in 2004. The DRA didn't happen until 2005. We started the building of that infrastructure for staff in 2006. So there was no existence of a Federal level contact, if, we, if you will. We had, prior to 2005, six full-time equivalents that had no funding that supported the States when questions came in to CMS. So there was really no structural vehicle uh, at the Federal level in 2005. I, I think points well, well made, and, and that and that is what your testimony is, how we are trying to do much better today at the Federal level. But I, I guess while we didn't have in 2004 in place, New Jersey, as the operator or the provider of the Medicare services that we are helping to fund, did and was responsible. And, and I guess what I am saying, have we even gone back to New Jersey and say, listen, you know, th this is a case where you blatantly failed somebody that we are paying you know, a huge share of you to provide this service, and because of your failure, you know, tens of millions of dollars was being lost, and but for that private citizen's efforts would have been forever lost. So what has New Jersey done? You know, in other words, what did New Jersey do to better uh, ensure that it is not repeated? And even though that may be at the State level, in addition to what we are doing, CMS has a responsibility to make sure they are doing it. Have we made those type of inquiries to New Jersey uh, to make sure they are doing much better? Yes, we have. We did contact New Jersey <coughs> and request um, information about uh, what happened and what was their uh, information in terms of how the communications took place. Um, we are still looking at that information to understand what actions that they plan to take to mitigate that in the future. In the and meantime, CMS has taken a number of actions related to how to report fraud, who are the contacts in the State, even through the 1-800-Medicare line. There is a, a clear vehicle for people to be able to reach us at any time. Uh, and I, I think that is critically important because of, of the efforts of trying to um, uh, encourage uh, beneficiaries who, as we talked to the previous panel, are, are truly on the front lines. I mean, they are the ones who see the you know inaccurate uh, information that you know if they're diligent as as Mr. West was and those are the ones who are, are suffering the consequences if they're fraudulently taken advantage of because of denying services so having a system in place is one thing but making sure we respond to the information that comes in to that system is going to be key um, a final question here and then my time is going to be out regarding maxim itself um, can you I don't know if you have here with you today or can estimate um, for this year fiscal year 2011, it just ended, roughly how much money was the federal, did uh, Maxim receive under the Medicaid program nationally? I would have to research that question. Yeah. I don't have that my, information. Uh, if you could provide that, my, my guess is um, it is hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. Uh, as a provider in 41 states, uh, they are probably receiving. And, and as uh, Mr. Cummings in the previous uh, round specified, it just is, to me, incredible that someone who knowingly, intentionally, a company defrauded the American people to the tune of tens of millions, if not more. This is what we, we know of and would never have known of but for the heroic efforts of a private citizen, that that company is still receiving hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars from the American taxpayers to provide a service. Um, and and, and you know, it, it just to me, sends a terrible message, as Mr. Cummings said, that companies are going to just look at this as the cost of doing business. You know, hey, if we get caught, we just pay a fine and we just factor that in, but we keep getting the business. I mean, in the real world, the private sector, if you defra defrauded somebody that you, you know, 130, 150 million dollars, I guarantee you, you're not going to be doing business with that company anymore. And they shouldn't be doing business with American taxpayers. 
So um, I, we need to do much better, and uh, I know there is also a criminal side uh, that we may get into with uh, Mr. Gowdy. So my time is well expired. I yield to the ranking uh, member, uh, Mr. Davis from Illinois. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, the Affordable Care Act put in place various provisions, and of course it was just passed last year, to help fight fraud and abuse in Medicare and Medicaid. The Congressional Budget Office estimates that these provisions, when fully implemented, will save American taxpayers $7 billion over the next 10 years. Ms. Bryce Smith, can you describe the tools and technical changes to the anti-fraud laws that are included in the Affordable Care Act that will directly benefit your office? Sure. Um, in the Affordable Care Act, it, it, it offered up several things related to provider enrollment and screening. And we believe that that is the best tool for making sure that we keep um, people who are more fraudulent or fraudsters um, out of the program and also be in a place to re-verify and validate them over time to make sure that um, we can keep them out of the program or adjust um, our scrutiny of them uh, through risk assessments, if you will, um, over time. So that is part of that. Then there is the um, payment uh, suspension activity with respect to uh, changing the level of proof, if you will, from a, a reliable evidence-based allegation to a credible allegation. Um, that will also give us additional flexibility. Then there is uh, also the opportunities for temporary moratoria that can be uh, effectuated through uh, that vehicle as well. Um, and also Congress um, recognized um, the shortcomings of the data as we have recognized the shortcomings of the data um, in the Medicaid program and, and offered up Section uh, 6504 that will allow us to strengthen the, the data elements that we desire and need for program integrity purposes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cantrell, what specific uh, aspects of fraud detection do you think would be most positively impacted by the activity that has been included or the provisions included in the Affordable Care Act? One of the things that, uh, that was included in the Affordable Care Act are stiffer penalties, stiffer sentences for those in, uh, convicted of health care fraud. And we believe, as, as was discussed during the first panel, that stiffer sentences are important in deterring ongoing fraud. Let me ask you and, and, and Ms. Bryce Smith, knowing that there are some of our colleagues who have put forth efforts and continue to push for repeal of the Affordable Care Act. If that was to happen, do you see your organizations being affected in any way, uh, certainly negatively affected, if we were to repeal the Affordable Care Act? Oh, I was waiting for you, Gary. Um, you know, before the Affordable Care Act, we had improper payments. Um, one would argue that I think we would still have the concerns around improper payments. I think um, we are working very diligently to address them. Um, I, I think many of the concerns I think about the repeal seem to be around the growth or the expansion of the programs. And what I have seen from Congress is a recognition that um, you have provided commiserate um, administrative tools and authorities to expand our efforts uh, commiserate with that growth. Mr. Cantrell. We did receive additional funding for our organization through the Affordable Care Act, and we were able to hire almost 100 new investigators, so that was certainly welcome. Could I suggest that uh, the Affordable Care Act strengthens your ability to weed out fraud and abuse in Medicare, Medicaid? I, I would agree with that, yes. Mr. Cantrell. 
some of the tools and certainly the additional agents on the ground will, will definitely assist us in, in weeding out additional fraud. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for yielding. <coughs> Excuse me, gentlemen, for yielding back. I recognize the subcommittee chairman, Mr. Gowdy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Bryce Smith, which states have the highest rate of improper payments? That is a, a very good question. We are aware which states they are. We do uh, what we refer to as a payment error rate measurement that bans 17 states on a three-year cycle. Um, we engage those states and expect corrective actions from those individual states, but we do not release it publicly. Well, I was looking for the name of a state, because it strikes me that you want to put your law enforcement slash prosecutorial resources where there is the highest level of graft or fraud or waste or abuse. So which five states would have the highest improper payment ratios? We would gladly share any of those data with our law enforcement partners, but we usually do not disclose them. Why? I mean, there, there, there are four states being sued right now by the Department of Justice for having the unmitigated temerity to want to enforce immigration laws. Why the reluctance to say which states can't get their act together with respect to Medicaid payments? What is the reluctance? I, I think it could be perceived as somewhat punitive. Um, I think there is a desire by CMS to work with our state partners to address uh, the improper payments in a meaningful way. Um, we are continuing to do that. The states know who they are. We work with them on a corrective action plan. We follow well, can, up on well, that. Well, then do this for me. Then, then tell me, are there any states that, that on an annual basis just don't seem to get their act together? I, I can understand not wanting to dime out uh, an episodic state that just had one bad year, but then later engaged in corrective actions. Are there any states that just have a history of Medicaid overpayments? I cannot for certain give you the repeated findings, because it is early in the per measurement cycles. We have now completed the fourth year of measuring the states. So we have passed the cycle of the first 17 states now being examined for the second time. All right. So you know who the states are. Agreed? I do not personally know who the states are, but my colleague But someone does. Knows. And they have made the decision to not publicize the states that are doing the worst job. I think our desire is to work with our state partners. And we are continuing to do that in a meaningful way, and we will continue to do so. Uh, Mr. Cantrell, I was under the mistaken impression, apparently, that the amount of loss impacted the amount of time you went to jail. Apparently, that is not the case, because in the Maxim case, uh, other than watching television at home for three months, I only saw one person go to a Federal Bureau of Prison. Uh, and that was for, what, five months? So, so is, it, has that changed since I left the U.S. Attorney's Office? Is the amount of loss or the amount of the fraud no longer a factor in the length of a prison sentence? The amount of fraud is a factor in the prison sentence, and it, it would depend, though, on the individuals who were convicted, the amount of fraud that was actually attributed to them. They still don't have relevant conduct? There is relevant conduct that is taken into consideration. Those are Well, they do it in drug cases. Boy, they, they take the lowest mule in a cocaine conspiracy, and they dump all the drugs they can possibly dump on them. But it doesn't happen when it is rich folk committing the crime. I don't think that is the case, sir. I think um, a recent example, we are seeing increased sentences throughout the country. Well, let me I ask you about that. Let me ask you yes, about sir. that. How many motions for upward departure are you aware of being filed? I don't have that information, sir. That, that would be the Department of Justice that would. Can you get that for me? Can you find out? Because that is a really good indicator to me of how serious someone is about criminal activity, whether or not they are going to, to, to move that the sentence be higher than what the guidelines was. Sure, we will research. So if you can tell me where to find that, I will be happy to do it. 
myself. If Mr. Crenshaw, if you could submit that to the committee uh, for the record, that would be great. I think we will have to get that information from the Department of Justice, but we will work with them to identify what we need to get and provide it Thanks, to you. Thank you, Gentleman Field. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My final question is, do you believe there is a presumption in favor of criminal prosecution over civil enforcement? Uh, when you prosecute somebody criminally, not only can you recoup the losses, but you also get to punish people. So is there a presumption in favor of criminal over civil? That is our presumption in the Office of Inspector General, Office of Investigations. What about the U.S. Attorney's Offices and the Department of Justice? I believe that is also the case of the U.S. Attorney's Office when, when there is evidence to support a criminal uh, indictment. You heard Mr. the facts in Mr. West's case. That wouldn't be a hard case for you and I to win, would it? I can't comment on the, the specifics of that. Oh, sure you can. I mean, he, he, just, he, just, he just announced it to the whole world. I mean, even you and I could win a case where you are billing someone while they are at the U.S. Attorney's Office for a meeting. You and I could win that, couldn't we? That case, uh, it, it sounds, sounds obvious. All, there were, I am sure, several factors that went into decisions uh, at the U.S. Attorney's Office to determine who to prosecute and who not to prosecute. I yield back. Thank the gentleman for yielding back. The uh, ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Cummings, recognized for five minutes. To Ms. Bryce Smith and to Ms. Cantrell, um, as you heard, I was very uh, upset that a kid from Baltimore, thousands of them, by the way, thousands, can face a lifetime of economic punishment over a few hundred dollars stolen, yet a company like Maxim can be found guilty of stealing from taxpayers, pay a fine and continue to bill the Federal Government for millions of dollars of services each year. Ms. Bryce Smith, do you uh, share that sentiment? Something's wrong with that picture. I'm equally concerned about the, the equity that you've pointed out. Yeah, and who has the power, by the way? Do you all have the power? Who has the power to, 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 to debar these companies? We do have the power to exclude providers. Now, you got some, huh, have you ever done it? Certainly we do. Well, why not this company? The decision on who to exclude is uh, based on several factors, uh, including access to care, uh, as well as the specific conduct and the expectation of whether they will continue the bad behavior or not. We utilize, in, in cases where we do not exclude corporations, we utilize corporate integrity agreements. In this case, there was a deferred prosecution agreement where we will monitor this corporation in hopes to bring them to the hell with monitoring. They have already done it. If you had somebody working in your house, cleaning your house, and you came home and your wife's bracelet that was worth $50 is missing, you don't hire them again. Da? What do you mean deferred prosecution? This company needs to go. How many other companies are like this? are doing, in other words, have defrauded the people of the United States of America, have taken away services from people like our witness, our earlier witness, and are still doing business with Medicaid. How many? You are the IG. You sat up here and you said all these wonderful things. It sounds nice. Oh, we are doing this and we are doing that. That is real nice. But what I am trying to tell you is that your normal is not good enough. You know, if, that, if you're going to come in here with a badge on your chest and talk about what you've done and a company that's taken millions of dollars away from taxpayers is still doing business and they come in 41 states and said, all right, we're ready to do business again. Yeah, we've stolen from you, but we're ready to go. And we say, okay, all right, we'll do it. Something is wrong with that picture and you're the IG. So is that the normal that we should expect? Here we are slashing budgets. People talking about slashing Medicare, slashing Medicaid, slashing Social Security. And we've got some greedy folks who are out there stealing money from people. And you're going to tell me that we have the power to debar and we're not using it? In, in what case will we use it? We use it, uh, we use it on average nearly 3,000 times every year. Well, why not this company? As I said, there are they are factors that play into the decision, depending on whether they are criminally convicted or whether there is uh, going to be an impact to access to care 
going forward and their expectation of whether or not they will continue to commit the fraud or whether we believe that through compliance monitoring we can bring them into the fold and allow them to continue to provide services to the, to the population that they are serving. Oh. Oh. In fact, the lady that steals your wife's brooch, you say to her, uh, or the cleaning person, you say to her, oh, Miss Jane or Mr. Johnson, yeah, you, you stole a brooch, but uh, we want you to come back in because we think you can be rehabilitated. We think the next time you have a cleaning assignment, you won't take the diamond ring. Something is wrong with that picture. And what, I guess what I'm trying to get through to you is that that is not the normal. Our country is better than that. And there are people in my district that are suffering because they can't get the services they need, but yet and still we are letting these companies do this. And by the way, there are other situations in government where people did much less than this. They'd be out. And again, I go back to the young boys and girls in my district, some of whom live in my block. And if they stole a $300 bike, they would be punished for a lifetime. Not a day, not an hour, and they damn sure wouldn't get a, a, a multi-million dollar contract and multi-million dollar contracts in 41 states. I mean, I would be embarrassed to even come in here and stick out my chest talking about what I've accomplished when the company still, they've got to be looking at us like we're fools. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to work on a bipartisan way to get rid of Maxim, because see, all of this stuff you're all talking about, it does not matter if at the end result, Mr. Gowdy said, it, said part of it, I'm almost finished, Mr. Chairman, part of it is making sure somebody goes to jail, but there's another part. That other part is saying to them that we are not going to allow you to do business and screw over the American people anymore. That's the second part. And you can do all these things you're talking about, bring in all the technology you want, talk about all these wonderful things you're doing, but if there's not that end result, you know what they do? They just come right back. And they pay the price, but they come right back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, gentlemen. Uh, gentleman from Arizona, Dr. Gozar is recognized. I can tell you, this is great playing the closer on these two gentlemen right here. I couldn't agree more. Being a health care provider who did Medicaid for seven years and left it for all the reasons they talked about it, I did not stop. I just provided it for free. This system, when we are starting to talk about access to care and the only provider is those that are thieving in one of the most densely populated parts of the country, is absurd to me, folks, absolutely absurd to me. So I want to ask you something real quickly. I want, to give you, I want to give you the opportunity to give yourself a grade in front of the American people on how you think you have done this job in regards to policing yourself. Ms. Bruce Smith, give yourself a grade. In light of our youngness of our program. I don't really care. Give me a grade. C. Mr. Cantrell. I would give us a B. I know, we know there is much more fraud out there that we are able, that we need to attack, but we are improving every year. This last year was a record year with 720 plus criminal convictions, which is over 50 more than their previous record year, and $4.6 billion in recoveries through these events criminal and civil fraud investigations. But you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you there, because I think what you have to do is you, you are, are working on behalf of the American people, and I doubt that they would give you above a D. Don't you agree with me? I think so. I've been out there on Main Street walking this, and so I understand it very, very well. Because there's a missing component. The process, the whole process is broken here. Because the problem for this gentleman, Mr. West here, would have been a lot less if he was empowered to help make those decisions on the ground. And we fail to do that. Let me ask you a question, Ms. Bruce Smith. When we were looking at this innovative ideas of making some change, did you contact Visa and MasterCard and what maybe some ideas they may have to reduce some of the fraud, waste, and abuse? CMS has engaged um, um, credit card companies in using the analytics and tools that they have available and try to apply that in the Medicare claims. How would, how do, would you look at that as far as the IT systems? I know that a lot of the states in the IT system, its lowest bid buys. Um, that is not usually a good investment as far as I am concerned. I'm a, I mean, dentists love their toys, okay? And the, the better the IT, the better. And so sometimes it is not the most frugal decision that always is better. Would you agree? Yes. Do we work with the states in, in allowing them to have that flexibility to working with that? Yes, we do. In fact, we have incentivized the states to upgrade and enhance their, their IT systems 
uh, for the future. We have done that through setting uh, what we refer to as a matching, a 90-10 match, where they get additional funding, but we apply criteria or expectations to that funding so we can have a better system at the State level to, for the Medicaid claims. So, you know, when you start looking at, I mean, many hands, I mean, I, I look at these two gentlemen looking at criminal prosecution, and, you know, very few people or fewer people, I should say, in the criminal division really want to renege on their, their uh, roles of parole. And the reason I look at that and I bring that to, to point is called bounty hunters, is because we have a lot more eyes on the prize. Okay? There, there are some incentives. And it seems to me when we look at these FMAPs and on reimbursement rates, we ought to be engaging the States uh, for activity, okay? as well as patients. The first person who is going to know is the patient and giving them some oversight on that bill. That is why it needs to be in hand. And I think that what we are trying to do is we are putting a Band-Aid here. And, and I, I will tell you, I am one of these people speaking. I am tired of Band-Aids here. I came to Congress to recorrect things. I think trying to reconstruct, uh, doing the same things over and over and expecting a different result is insanity, absolutely insanity. But we need to start empowering patients, and that is not what you have done. There is no part of this that does not empower these patients. I, and I can tell you I have firsthand knowledge of that. I served our dental patients who couldn't even be seen by a federally qualified health center. I can repeat stories not as, as bad as this because they are dental, but I can repeat this all day long. It is sad. Because I think what we ought to be doing is, is sharing that information all across the sandbox, not playing and not explaining who's, who is a bad player here and allowing them to be still participating to the rules is criminal, and it is criminal on our part for not changing it. That is what is wrong here. So let me ask you a question. I, I want to see thinking outside the box. How could you envision something that we could empower patients like Mr. West to have, a, have some skin in the game, to be one of those whistleblowers and to uphold their ability and right? Give me some ideas, Ms. Bryce Smith. We have already observed that there are a handful of States that have developed um, sort of reward programs, if you will, for, that are short of sort of the KETAM approach of the False Claims Act, but will give uh, cash for tips, if you will related to health care fraud. So there are already a handful of innovative states that have recognized that that is an additional insight and benefit to fighting fraud. Do you have an insider newsletter that says, hey, listen, these states are on the cutting edge, um, days to crime, days to time? We are using our education mix to be able to communicate and outreach that, that information. Uh, we also use best practices summaries for the states so that we can inform other states of what what states that are being innovative are doing. So we use our websites, we use forums and meetings and, and our, our Medicaid Institute to communicate that information. Well, thank you. I'm out of time. Thank you, gentlemen. I'm um, going to go to a second round here uh, while we have the opportunity for a few more questions, yielding myself five minutes. Um, first, a, a follow-up um, on the uh, questions of Mr. Gowdy about the states that are most egregious, you know, as far as improper payments, um, it, it sounds like your contention is that information is not subject to the Freedom of Information Act to FOIA. Uh, I am not sure on FOIA, but we can certainly, I can certainly look into yeah. that. Because uh, I, I, I share his, I guess, uh, statements uh, regarding the fact that you know American taxpayers are sending two hundred. $75 billion to states to handle properly. And I think American taxpayers have a right to know which states are doing it well and which states are not. And uh, I am not sure. Uh, I would be interested in any additional feedback from CMS as to why we don't want to share. Uh, you know, often in uh, cases of uh, deadbeat dads, one of the ways we get them to pay is we publicize you know, that they are not paying. You know, we shame them into paying. Or maybe we need to shame these states and to do a better job of protecting American people's money. Uh, so um, I do look forward to further interaction with you on uh, CMS on that. Um, Mr. Cantrell, on the, on the specific case of uh, Mr. West, 
Um, appreciate the various factors. Uh, I, I find it somewhat you know, unbelievable that we are still doing business with this entity. Can you tell me when you, the, uh, the 41 states, uh, as part of the agreement, uh, in addition to Mr. West's case in New Jersey, in, um, was there evidence of other similar misconduct in other states regarding this company? Yes, there was. The, uh, the, the $150 million was not related specifically to Mr. West's scenario. It was a broader issue. How, in, in how many states would, if you know or estimate, that uh, we found misconduct? I don't know specifically the answer to that, but we could Because that, get back to me, would go to uh, if it was just New Jersey and we had some bad apples in one you know, subdivision of this large company, that is one thing to say we are not going to punish the whole company. But if we found similar misconduct in half, 20 of the 41 states, that is a very different story. So if you could provide to the uh, subcommittee uh, how many states and how many different states did we find similar misconduct by maxim? Uh, you know. I don't believe our, our evidence suggested that they were committing 100 percent fraud across the country, but I don't know how many states. Yeah. Uh, but we will get back to you on that. Yeah, I would welcome that information. Um, also, um, you know, when we are uh, looking at um, an analogy to the private uh, I individuals uh, in a criminal sense when we have a victim, because uh, most of our focus has been about the money, which is very important, but it is also about the care provided. And as we heard from the testimony of Mr. West, because of the fraud Maxim committed, it wasn't just the money being lost, it was care to an individual. That is an even more serious crime, in my opinion, because of their intentional fraudulent conduct, they denied medical care. Um, given that he was a victim directly, taxpayers in total were a victim, but he was a victim directly of their misconduct. Was he consulted or any other similar victims consulted as to whether they thought the settlement with Maxim was acceptable punishment for their wrongdoing? I believe, as in most of these cases, the attorneys for Mr. West and Ms. Page would probably have been participating in some of those discussions, yes. I don't know specifically in this case how it was, but that is, I believe, the routine. So, um, and and they are given the opportunity to say, yes, um, I, I sign off on this, or they are just aware of it? I think they are aware of it. I don't know that they have uh, the ability to stop, stop it from happening. Um, is there, you know, in a sentencing in a court, there is a formal process where the victims can offer testimony to the final decider. Do you know if there is any formal process of that nature where a victim can make a presentation to the, you know, the U.S. attorney directly that is going to make that decision? Uh, certainly there is the opportunity. I don't think there was a sentencing hearing in this case, so there was no, it may not have been the opportunity to do it in a courtroom, but there, I, I believe there would have been conversations between the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, and the Assistant United States Attorney, Mr. West. My, my hope is that uh, you know, we make sure that is a formal process, a routine part of any settlement. Uh, because I, I do acknowledge that you could have somebody who had some bad apples in a small way. You know, that has got to be factored in versus a more deliberate, across the board fraudulent case. Uh, but we have to remember there are victims here that aren't just about money. It is about care being denied. And that is a very serious crime, uh, in my opinion. Uh, I want to quickly get to uh, two other issues. Um, in, uh, in your testimony, uh, Mr. Cantrell, you talk about a, uh, the Medicaid statistical information um, uh, service, uh, and you reference in your testimony about some of the data is 12 years old. H how common is, is that? Sir, I'm, let me correct the record. That is one and a half years old. Okay. Yes. I, um, yeah, I, 12 years seems just right. so outrageous. But even one and a half, when you talk about then trying to correct it, I mean, it goes to the point of, of I guess, what you talked about and, and Ms. Bryce Smith, of trying to much more quickly identify, respond to, and prevent. Um, you know, because one and a half years even is, is the money is long gone. We agree. You know? The more timely the data, as close as we can get to real time, the better we are. We, on the Medicare side, as I said, we have a lot more success to talk about. We use that data, which is much more timely, to uh, mine for fraud, identify areas where we have hot spots of fraud. We have the uh, strike force model, which we utilize. To, we deploy those to areas of the country where there is high instances of fraud, such as 
South Florida, Bronx, New York, uh, Detroit, Los Angeles, Dallas, Houston. So uh, seeking to, to replicate where you have had successful Medicare to Medicaid. Absolutely. And, and that's one of the things that came through to me in, in, in preparing for this, is that it seems that there is almost a conscious decision within CMS to devote much more attention and resources to Medicare fraud than to Medicaid fraud. Is, is that a fair, uh, until the last, say, uh, five years? Is that a, a fair statement? I would have to defer to my colleague on that, on that question. Ms. Bryce Smith, is that that, that we are kind of late to the game on the Medicaid well, I, side? I, I think you are recognizing certainly the support that Congress gave us through DRA in that five-year period. Right. Um, but I think one could take that a step further. The Medicaid program was structured to be uh, administered day to day by the State. So um, those claims are going to the States or their fiscal agents. And, and we are engaged at the, the post pay yeah. with a subset of data to try to uh, oversee the, the I, I think very valid point. I think in the Deficit Reduction Act and, and as uh, Mr. Davis well reflected in the Affordable Care Act, there is a greater and greater understanding here in Washington in the last five years that maybe it is State administered, but bottom line is we are paying the majority of the bill. And, and so we need to be more proactive in protecting the taxpayer funds. And, uh, and so that is why I say I think we are late to the game, but we are finally getting there uh, and, and being more, um, I think, hands-on in trying to protect those dollars. I, I know uh, I'm going to one last question. I appreciate my colleagues' indulgence here, being way over my time. And uh, Ms. Yocum, in your testimony, you talk about the uh, again the, the Medicaid st statistical information uh, system, and you talk about um, what states are supposed to provide. But it says uh, MIS, MSIS does not contain billing information such as referring providers' identification number or beneficiary's name. Um, the, the less information provided, the harder it is to say, hey, this provider obviously is, is billing for uh, in an ordinate number, and that would be one of those flags that would jump out that there may be something askew here. Right. Um, can you try to address, you know, as you, you know, based on your knowledge, why aren't we requiring States yeah. to provide all that information yeah. to make the MSIS system a more useful tool to be more timely but also more comprehensive? I can't speak to why we don't require it, but I can speak to the effect of not having that information available. As you say, it's impossible to do some of the data mining techniques and things that are done routinely on the Medicare program. Yeah. GAO does have some work underway right now that is looking at the State's uh, capabilities and their activities in this regard. Thank you. Um, May I speak a little yeah, yes, bit Ms. to Price that? Um, I, I just want you to be aware that we are taking active actions to actually enhance that data. We are referring to it as transformed emphasis data, which is largely expanded. We are currently pilot testing it now to, to test drive, if you will, if that data will give us a, a better uh, output in terms of program integrity activity among 10 volunteer states. So we are very excited about that. Yeah, my, my hope is um, that, that that is successful and, you know, um, I will say more successful than the IDR and the, uh, the one program integrity, which many years in doesn't seem that we are getting the results that were intended and, and uh, certainly not in the time frame. And, and I am way over my time. Uh, Mr. Davis, I don't know if you had other questions. I uh, yield to the Ranking Member, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, the cap on services and denial of, of his dental needs were a major red flag to Mr. West that something was awry, that something was wrong, something was not right with his benefits. Uh, Ms. Bryce Smith, to those patients without a similar cap, are they less likely to ensure that their services are properly being rendered and billed to Medicaid correctly? I think what we have learned about fraud, if you, um, many fraudsters can submit a very clean looking claim and you have to uh, examine many other factors such as complaints from beneficiaries, such as our own data analytics in terms of patterns of trends to see, does this really make sense? Is this even feasible that 
he could have uh, used that many services, for example? The, the, the 1 800 Health and Human Services tips hotline is widely publicized as an avenue that individuals can use to provide information that assists in combating fraud, waste, or abuse in Federal health care programs. While the extent of health care fraud is estimated to be in the billions of dollars each year, HHS emphasizes that Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries are the front line of defense in detecting Medicare and Medicaid fraud because they have firsthand knowledge of the health care services they have received. Mr. West contends that there was no follow-up to his hotline calls. And so, Mr. Cantrell, could you provide information on the 800-HHS TIPS hotline, what procedures are followed, and any time frames there might be to, to handle and or respond in, to complaints? Sure. We have uh, the 1-800-HHS TIPS telephone line, uh, which in this case, uh, Mr. West, we don't believe he contacted that. I think he called uh, state and local offices. But we have that phone number. We also have a website where we collect uh, complaints via web form. And between, between those two mechanisms, we receive thousands of complaints every year. And we, we have a process for evaluating those complaints, uh, determining the uh, whether there is enough information there to proceed with an investigation or whether there isn't enough information. In some cases, we refer those complaints out to our regional offices for our investigators to look at, look at further. And in other cases, we refer them directly to CMS for administrative review. While our focus today has been on Medicaid fraud, I um, will just point out that there is also fraud in, in private sector in private health care. For example, in 2009, uh, United Health paid $350 million to settle lawsuits related to the intentional manipulation of the reasonable and customary rate. And also, Pfizer in 2009 paid a $2.3 billion uh, silver and criminal penalty for unlawfully marketing medications for conditions that they had not been approved for by the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, Ms. Melvin, Mr. Yoakum, could uh, you comment on the challenges from GAO's perspective of, of looking seriously into the private sector fraud and abuse situation? Well, one of the challenges of looking to the private sector, I think, particularly on Medicaid, might be the Federal-State partnership. Um, that is an unusual circumstance to begin with. Uh, data is also a huge challenge in terms of combating fraud, and the steps that CMS is taking right now are, are in the right direction, but there is a lot of work to be done there. Mr. Melvin. From a technical perspective, uh, in looking at moving data, for example, from the States into the integrated data repository, a lot of the key challenge uh, stems uh, or surrounds uh, having to make sure that the data is uh, of a format, uh, that there are data elements, file formats that are consistent with the IDR uh, requirements for file formats. So there are technical challenges uh, in being able to do that. One of the concerns we raised in our report is um, CMS's plan, as we understand it, to try to bring all of the 50 states or 50-plus uh, programs uh, data into IDR by September 2014, I believe. Uh, the concern we have uh, is what type of planning they will have in place to make sure that they can, in fact, um, uh, bring that data, uh, consolidate it, uh, identify all of the data elements that are very different. Uh, we have talked previously about uh, disparate systems at all of the different uh, State programs, and those have to be uh, addressed. The differences in data have to be addressed and brought into the system in a common format. Um, we have not seen plans yet. We haven't done the work that would allow us to know how effectively CMS is handling that particular challenge. Thank you very much. I want to thank all of the witnesses and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this hearing. And I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Uh, Dr. Gosar. 
So let me ask you a question. Um, we are talking about fraud. Is it just limited to um, the private sector, or is it also for public health? Ms. Bryce Smith. I believe that there are equally uh, concerns in private and public sector in terms of fraud, waste, and abuse. And I think uh, evidence of that certainly is um, the American Medical Association's own fourth annual report card on health insurers, which showed their error rate was double, uh, more than double, certainly the Medicaid error rate. So when you think about extrapolating even that out, you are talking about a savings in the private sector of $70 billion right there. So I think that is an example. I think um, with Medicaid and Medicare, two big high-priority programs, we certainly recognize that we uh, tend to report and disclose, and we are transparent, as we should be, uh, but many private companies don't have to be transparent about the fraudulent activity that may be occurring. But I also want to highlight, you know, like federally qualified health centers, would you say that, you know, I am a dentist, just to make sure that we all get that out there, um, that when we um, work a rule, um, for example, a child, we numb up a whole quadrant and, and then we only do one tooth at a time because of the reimbursement rate. Would you call that fraud? I do. Well, it, it, it sounds like there are a lot of things going on that we would have to take in consideration in terms of how that billing is occurring. Um, it sounds like that might be an effort to unbundle services, possibly. It might draw some suspicions, depending on how it Do we have the same scrutiny on federally qualified health centers as we do as everybody else? We uh, certainly, they are inclusive, although I think our efforts tend to be focused on where we will leave the greater Medicaid expenditures and the greater vulnerabilities are and the categories of services that tend to drive the error rate as we know it today. Gotcha. Um, Ms. Yoakum, do you, do you believe that the Medicaid, the state Medicaid systems are, are maybe too big and unwieldy the way they are? Too big. You know, to kind of to, to oversee properly? We're, we, we're finding the, uh, a big problem here, and it just seems like it's un, unwieldy. I think the actions taken by the Congress under the Deficit Reduction Act and under the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act augment a lot of activity which can help oversee these programs in a better fashion. Um, to speak to the, the State's end on this, I, there, this is a partnership, but CMS also needs to be able and willing to um, give up some of the rules and yeah, I mean, I, so, yeah. But, but it seems to me like we're talking about a broken system. Okay, it, it's very obvious to me. Um, you know, I'm from rural Arizona. We don't get paid. I can tell you right now in dentistry, it's you might be get paid in six months. You know, so I don't know too many people that can make a business work that way. Yeah, and somehow we do, but in this <laughs> government takeover of healthcare, that's the only way I can talk about it. Okay. We are going to dump another 20 million people into this, into a broken system. I don't see a lot of urgency into fixing this situation and, and looking outside the box for solutions. Do you agree with me? Mm -hmm. Well, it is not my position to agree or, degree or disagree in, in well, that regard. I mean, would you agree it is broken right I, now? I think the facts are that we need to do better on program integrity. Yeah. And it is and, and going to be really trouble, tr yeah. problematic when we dump another 20 million people in yeah. here. And the best approaches are, frankly, to, to keep the payment from happening at the beginning. Some of GAO's I'm liking where you're going with this, because, you know, in Medicare, most of our Medicare patients are older, right? right. They're very responsible, yeah. and they've been empowered to look at bills, which is, gets back to my point about empowering people mm -hmm. um, in, in, in being part of that facade. So I really right. uh, I want to go back right to that and, and ask you a question. Do any states use the advanced analytics? Um, like the credit card industry um, that would spot in real time an outlier billing practice before payment goes out the door? We have just started work to look at that. So I don't feel in a position yet to say exactly what States are doing. We do know that there are analytical tools that are being used in some capacity by them at this point. But uh, I couldn't speak to how much or uh, and to what extent they are using them. Is there any rewards to utilize those analytic tools? The, the analytic tools, as I um, understand them, are to be used uh, in particular to help prevent 
uh, improper payments so that uh, it allows them to uh, analyze data, if you will, mine data, and to really make calls on data that would help them to prevent fraud and improper payments on the front end uh, versus, for example, the integrated data repository and 1PI tools that we are currently, um, have, have currently assessed, uh, which are at this point at least focused on the back end. Uh, in terms of uh, identifying improper payments after they have been made. Couldn't we, and I mean, indulge me just for a second. I mean, it, to me it seems like it, that there is a, there's a common tool here that I want to get to. It is it's on the front end with a card empowering the patient to pay to make the system a lot stream, a lot faster. Because here is another part to this, okay? There is also the State Board, Okay, because when you defraud a patient on a billing process directly when they are paying for it, it is also a standard of care issue. So therefore, there is a better penalty that we are talking about. And so I think that there should be some aspect that we look at the front end, more so the back end, and empowering patients. And I think you have got something that works very, very well. I come from a state that the dental board is extremely active. Okay, Arizona is not one, two, or three in the country for activity, I mean for population. But we are for activity because patients are empowered, and that is where we need to go. And I think that is what we are failing to do, is empowering people. And I see constantly, you know, when I am approached by the WIC program saying, Dr. Gosar, we need you to sign a contract. I am like, why are we signing a contract? What is the deal? Why is it taking a WIC mother six or seven visits just to see the doctor? Something is wrong there. But there is also something right, because women are speaking out about that process. And I think the more eyes on the prize, the stiffer the penalties, I think the better opportunity that, that happens. And empowering states to make those jurisdictions I mean, really helps. And I think standard of care is a, is a remarkable tool. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. And I uh, would just comment that, uh, as we heard in Mr. West's testimony, I, I, it seems that not only not empowering the patient the beneficiary, but in, in, in this case we heard we discouraged and prevented them from taking you know, hold. So uh, we, we do, certainly do need to do much better. And um, you know, I, I think the, the, as we wrap up here, kind of uh, a final comment, and, and that is that um, you know, we need to remember there, there, there are two issues at hand here. First, it is protecting tax dollars. And, and while uh, certainly we are glad to have the uh, improper payment rate uh, for Medicaid to be down, we are still talking about $22 billion of improper payments this past year that we know of. And, and again, using Mr. West's case, but for his individual heroic efforts to dis uncover the fraud, we would not have known about Maxim. And so how many other Maxims are out there that we don't know about? You know, the $22 billion is what we do know about of improper payments. Um, so uh, you know, when we talk about the whole number of $125 billion, um, the, uh, there are some estimates that that is probably at least $200 billion, you know, but we only know of $125 billion. So uh, we certainly have a lot of work to do. I, I want to thank each of our witnesses for uh, your testimony here today, both your written testimony, which is, again, very helpful in preparing. Uh, and your oral testament here today, and uh, most importantly for your efforts day in and day out. I know we are all on the same page, that we are we're trying to seek the same result. And um, you know, I think that um, with the Deficit Reduction Act of 2005, the Affordable Care Act uh, language on trying to better go after fraud, uh, we are all collectively better acknowledging and starting to commit the resources necessary to protect ours ensure the care that is earned and deserved is provided and not denied inappropriately. So commend you for your efforts, and uh, we certainly as a committee look forward to continuing to work with you, both subcommittees, uh, work with you and your respective agencies uh, on this important issue. Um, we will keep the record open for two weeks for additional information as was requested to be submitted, and we stand adjourned. <laughs>